Good. I'm calling uh, the uh, regular meeting of the governing body, May 25, 2022, to order. It is 5.03 p.m. Uh, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councillor Cassett. Uh, we'll go to the uh, Salute to the New Mexico Flag by count led by Councillor Lindell. Invocation Remembrances by Councillor Romero Worth. Please rise as you are able. Good evening, everyone. I want to start by acknowledging the feeling of loss I believe we are all experiencing at different levels, directly and indirectly. Loss of innocent lives in yet another school shooting. Loss of loved ones to a persistent virus. Loss of property, livelihoods, and special places because of fire. The continuing threat of loss from climate change, ongoing drought, and increased fire risk. Where will we find strength? I submit we are finding it in each other, and I'd like to read the prayer for peace. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Thank you. Are there remembrances that anyone would like to make at this time? Why don't we just take another minute to think about the families in Texas, the families in New York, families across the country who have been visited by violence and loss, senseless hatred, uh, and send them our thoughts and our commitment to do better. Let's bow our heads for a minute. Thank you. Please be seated. Our assistant city clerk, welcome tonight. Glad to have you with us. Um, could you please call the roll? Chair, sure, Mayor. Councilor Cassett? Here. Councilor Chavez? Here. Councilor Lee Garcia? Present. Councilor Lindell? Here. Councilor Rivera? Councilor Rivera is excused. Councilor Romero Worth? Here. Councilwoman Villarreal? Present. Mayor Weber? Present. And also Councilor Michael Garcia is excused. Is excused as well. Thank you. We have a quorum, Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, can we get a, a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. There's a motion to uh, approve the agenda, and there's a second. Um, I always need help on this. Is that uh, voice vote? All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. How about the consent agenda? Can I get a motion on that? Move to approve. Second. A motion to approve. There was a tie between Councilwoman Varel and Councilor Cassett, and a second from Councilor Romero Worth, I believe. You switched to be the second. Very gracious of you. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. 
Before we go on to the agenda, I know there are a lot of folks here for a variety of reasons. Some of you have come to speak when it is time for the uh, petitions from the floor. Others want to speak when it is a public hearing. I just want to notice everyone who's here that typically we don't get to those things till later in the evening. Um, so if you, you're obviously welcome, more than welcome to be with us uh, through the agenda, but if you wanted to uh, be more, um, you wanted to use your time elsewhere till we get to those two items, they will be uh, further on in the calendar, closer to seven o'clock typically. So it's, it's a stretch between now and then. Please stay if you want, um, you're always welcome. Uh, if you would rather go grab a bite to eat and come back, you're certainly welcome to do that. So with that said, uh, we move to item 8A, uh, Assistant City Clerk, do you want to bring that forward? Yes, this is a presentation for congratulations for regional solid waste rodeo winners from Environmental Services Division. And I believe Shirlene will present. Good evening, Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. Um, um, amid the beautiful words Council Romero Worth brought up, um, I, I was just in, in Texas yesterday at a sustainability meeting, um, and we're, we're all working hard to try to address um, all of those problems, um, but we're, we need to do it faster. <laughs> um, but I appreciate those words. They meant a lot to me. Um, and, and I hope I bring a bright spot in, in the midst of all that. I'm, I'm very, very proud um, to, uh, to be here tonight just to tell you about um, our terrific uh, solid waste operators, solid waste and recycling collection operators. Um, every one of them that works for us is absolutely terrific and an essential worker. Um, we are members of the Solid Waste Association of North America as a city, and that, that is SWANA. And it represents the majority of governments that, that have a solid waste arm within their city. It provides professional leadership, uh, training specifically on household hazardous waste programs and landfill management and landfill gas and um, uh, higher, high things. It, it, uh, it provides um, safety tips and advocacy at the federal level uh, for things that affect us. Um, and one of the really great things that SWANA does is uh, host, uh, sponsor, and sanction um, rodeos, R-O-A-D-E-O, -E rodeos. And they are designed to feature the skills of our, um, our frontline workers, our collection operators, our landfill heavy equipment operators, and our mechanics. And um, we were thrilled. It's, it's a little bit hard sometimes in New Mexico since I've been here. We've put on a couple of rodeos for the state, but we were, uh, we were thrilled to um, accept an invitation from the Texas chapter that um, hosts a, a very large rodeo every year to participate with them. And so we were able to take four of our operators and also the agency, Santa Fe Solid Waste, Santa Fe Solid Waste Management Agency, uh, was also able um, to send some employees and uh, I'm just going to say we went to Texas and kicked some butt. <laughs> um, our, uh, our drivers competed together. Um, so in the overall competition, um, our, our drivers from ESD, um, Mr. Um, Patricio Lopez, placed second against, against the other Texas drivers in the automated side load competition. And um, Albert Lopez, who is a commercial driver, he placed second overall in the front load competition. So the front load, that's the truck that picks up the dumpsters, and the automated side load is the one that picks up the residential carts. Um, they, we, we had four operators. They all did um, incredibly well against um, well-seasoned uh, rodeo uh, competitors in Texas. We're really proud of them. Um, but it, 
they, they rank in New Mexico alone as far as the National Rodeo is concerned. So um, Patricio is New Mexico's first place winner. Um, and so uh, on behalf of the city, On behalf of the city, well, first of all, they got the, the best thing. They took the Texans' belt buckles away, which were the prizes. Um, I hope that they would bring them. Oh, he's wearing it! <laughs> so that was a sore loss for many of those um, other drivers. Um, but just, uh, just on behalf of the city, we have um, just a, a certificate of appreciation for uh, being in the event. And, and then I'm going to switch for a minute to Hector Enriquez, um, who also did very well. Um, and so appreciation for taking a chance and, and going to the rodeo and uh, representing New Mexico um, and, and really showing how great we are. Um, they, they drive under some conditions that most of those Texans have never seen, mountain roads and snowy roads and things like that. And then I'm going to change hats real quick. Um, I am currently the chair of, or president of the New Mexico chapter, the, the Roadrunner chapter of SWANA. So as the president and on behalf of SWANA, um, we have uh, another certificate for the first place winner. So um, at, we'll be sending three people. At, and oh, I also really want to mention Ryan Moeller, who won first place uh, for the mechanics competition from the agency. So, I mean, Santa Fe, so we've got some really incredible uh, people working in our solid waste field. Um, the, the, the winners of the competition for the state get to go to nationals, so they'll be competing against people from all over the country in October. And it just so happens, it was just a coincidence, that the nationals will be in El Paso. So if you're going down to El Paso in October, maybe you want to check it out. But um, we just wanted to acknowledge how terrific our operators are and thank them. Um, some of them couldn't be here, but uh, just, just wanted to let you know um, how great they are. Congratulations. <laughs> Councilor Lindell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have the pleasure every Tuesday of seeing that guy in the front row. And um, Tricio, more than being a good driver, your attitude and your caring and what I see you do for some people, um, we can't buy that and we can't pay you enough to do that. It's who you are. And I'm very, very proud to work with you. And don't you dare change routes. <laughs> Councilwoman Beria. Thank you, Mayor. Just wanted to congratulate all of you and Patricio and Hector and also um, Albert and Ryan who are not with us. And just we appreciate that you represent the city of Santa Fe so well and such skill. And just it's exciting to hear about stuff like this. I'm, I'm glad we're bringing this back because we haven't done this in a long time. So thank you for being with us and thank you for all you do every single day. Yes. I think we all should. Hey, Councillor uh, Garcia, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Congratulations, guys, and uh, I, I have a question. So you won the belt buckle. Did you have to put something up in wager? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wondered what the, you know, was racing for pinks or working for belt buckles. I don't know what it was. Good job. Great. Congratulations, everybody. Way to go. Congratulations. Thanks, Shirley. Appreciate you guys. Great job. You represent. We're so proud of you and uh, puts a big, big smile on our face to whoop those guys. So way to go. <laughs> nice job. And Madam Clerk, Madam Assistant City Clerk, uh, item 8B, please. This is a presentation for wildland and firefighters who were deployed to assist with the suppression of the Calf Canyon Hermit's Peak Fire in Las Vegas, New Mexico from May 2nd, 2022 to May 15th, 2022. And Chief Moya is here to present. Chief, you have the floor.
Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, yeah, so here to just talk about uh, the past deployment and the current deployment that we're currently at uh, right now with the city of Santa Fe helping out uh, up in San Miguel County again. So this, just a little bit brief, this is our picture that we took right before we left uh, Las Vegas from Highlands uh, on Sunday, May 15th. That was the remaining uh, squad that was left. Um, there was probably easily half of that more uh, that had to leave home a little earlier. But under Las Vegas one, we had I had about, I think, 75 people that I was uh, managing while we were out there with 20 different resources. But, so again, Las Vegas uh, resource assigned. We had five units from the city of Santa Fe, one unit from Santa Fe County, one unit from Torrance County, one unit from Bernalillo County, one whole task force, which is a combination of uh, different types of engines and so forth from Colfax County. Uh, we had two different units from Guyana's Fire Department, which was a local resource in that area. And then one strike team that was from uh, Santa Barbara, California. This is again, like I said last meeting, the first time we've ever had any uh, California OES resources here in the state of New Mexico. Uh, to equal that was 20 pieces of equipment staffed with 75 personnel. Uh, the crews completed a 14-day assignment. Our tasks were to protect the city of Las Vegas and their municipal watershed. Basically, um, looked at it as uh, just kind of how we'd be able to uh, combat the fire, basically, on our side of the hill, because their structure is pretty much set up the same way that we are. Uh, we responded to six calls for service during the 14-day period, one being an additional wildland fire that we had early in the morning that we were able to contain a half an acre. Uh, so we were able to put a lot of people on it and knock it down right away. Uh, currently, we have crews that are up in Pecos, New Mexico, uh, assigned to, again, the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire. Uh, currently, we have, and again, five units from the city of Santa Fe, three from Santa Fe County, one unit from Torrance County, uh, two units from Valencia County, and two units from Santa, Fe, or Santa Rosa Fire Department equal 13 pieces of equipment staffed with uh, 35 personnel to include everybody. Currently, we are tasked with being up in the Pecos Canyon area, working on structure triaging and prepping all the homes in the event if that fire does come around or come down from the top through that canyon. So we're doing everything we can in our power right now uh, to make those homes uh, hopefully basically be fireproof at that point in time, removing any vegetation, any wood piles, any combustible material away from the homes that would aid in, unfortunately, that house uh, being started by that fire at any point in time. Um, and we're also tasked with initial attack within the area of what we call the TFR. So when we have a wildland fire, they put a TFR within that area that doesn't allow commercial pilots, uh, private pilots, anybody to fly within that area. So with that being said, all the aircraft that's assigned to that fire is responsible for working that incident that is on that. So we have to have resources on the ground as well to be able to assist with that. So since we're unfortunately the, the locals to that area, they've tasked us with um, the response of IA in that area, just because of our local knowledge and we have of that community. Um, going to the current conditions, uh, fire conditions, Hermit Speak, Calf Canyon right now. As of 6 o'clock this morning, it's sitting at 311,148 acres. Currently, there's 2,987 personnel assigned to the incident, and the fire is currently uh, contained at 42%. Going into the Cerro Plato, the one that's out to the west of Santa Fe, as of this morning, it was 45,605. They have 575 personnel assigned to the incident. And this fire is 92% contained. Uh, full containment is expected uh, any day now. So they are working good progress on that one, especially, and don't expect anything to come out of that. Looking at the last heat map, everything's pretty cool. And no issues with heat around any of the perimeters. Um, at this time, stand for any questions that you may have or, or for myself or the chief. Thank you, sir. Are there questions? Just let me see a hand. Questions from the governing body? Councillor Kasson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you both for, for being here and just for your continued leadership and dedication to this tragedy that's happening in our state. Um, and to the crews, 
Uh, I know that people are still questioning how they can help. Are donations still being accepted? Where are they being accepted? And what is the current status of what is most beneficial at this time? Uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Councilwoman Cassett, uh, yes. So Station 5, we are doing donations. It really slowed down a lot. So I'm not advertising in front of Station 5. You know, we're doing it, but people have knocked on the door and we're more than happy to take them. Another uh, location would be State uh, Employees Credit Union on St. Michael's and Cerritos. They're still accepting donations. And also uh, uh, Director Williams' uh, Salvation Army um, is taking donations for them, and they will be delivering them as well. So, so we have been delivering every day still. So I delivered two pellets of water yesterday and the day before. We delivered a huge trailer load of equipment. So we are continuing to supply them with whatever, whatever needs there. Okay, and is it, is it still, uh, I know you had mentioned before, water, um, Gatorade, things like that, non-perishable foods, there had been. Mayor, Mr. Mr. Mayor, Councilor, uh, Woman Cassett, yes, all those things are great. Uh, still continued, I think last time I was here, just no clothes that are been worn, and, you know, clean clothes, make sure they're washed, no used food. We had that conversation already. So those are the big things, but water, um, it's a big necessity they need. They've been telling me, so I've been setting pellets. We had a bunch, bunch of donations from Home Depot and Lowe's delivered to Station 5, so I've been setting those up by the pellet up to them. So um, it's not any many time soon, so we'd be more than happy to keep getting these donations, and we'll be more than happy to send them, keep sending them to Vegas, send them to Pinasco, and we've been sending them to Taos. So all three of those places have been accepting our, our generous donations from the citizens of South. Wonderful. Thank you. And if somebody wanted to make a financial donation, is that still something that we have set up? Yeah. So state employees credit union. So if you go into the state employees credit union, that is where that would be done. And you just say we're going to do it for the Cap Canyon and Hermit's Peak Fire, and they will be more than happy to do it there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Um, first, please make sure all the firefighters know how much we appreciate their hard work and their commitment and their selfless duty. Uh, it's, it's truly an act of courage, heroism, and uh, hard work for them to do what they're doing. Um, and I had a question for you about the last slide you put, one of the last slides you put up. I, I was hoping you could walk us through the a difference between containment and other uh, terms of art that you all use in wildland control of a fire. I, I, if I remember correctly from other briefings you've given us, there's kind of for the lay person, containment isn't necessarily the end of the game. There are other factors that need to be put into uh, understanding when it's truly uh, safeguarded. So as it relates to containment, and the other one we'll use is control. Uh, control is basically when we've stopped forward progress of the fire. Um, containment is how much line that we actually have constructed that is causing the fire to hold within the fire perimeter of itself. So at this time, there's you know for the Cerro Palado fire, they're saying 92% contained. Uh, they what we have on the map is a black line completely around that fire, which uh, equals up to 92%. Uh, going into the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire, 42% uh, contained is what we're looking at. So the other numbers obviously that equal up to 100% is full containment of that fire is unfortunately at this time uncontrolled fire line. And they cannot assure that it would not move at that point in time. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments, congratulations, words of appreciation, gratitude. Thank you. Really much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Assistant City Clerk, item 8C. This is release of 2022 area median income AMI data and updates to the Santa Fe Homes Program pricing schedule for 2022. And Director Alexander Ladd is here to present. Is that mic on? You want to tap it and make sure you've got full? 
All right. Please. How's that? That's better. Much better. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you for your time tonight. The uh, memo that was distributed to you has a lot of words and a lot of numbers in it. I am not going to bore you all to tears by going through every little bit of it. So I'm going to start with the big picture, and then I'm happy to answer any specific questions. Uh, the big picture is that we use a data statistic produced by the Department of Housing and Urban Development called the Area Median Income to establish what is an affordable home sales price or an affordable rent for different income tiers. Uh, the way, the basic premise of this process is that it is affordable if someone is paying no more than one third of their monthly income for their housing costs, including utilities um, and other associated housing costs. So we use the, the, the income ranges that HUD establishes and we calculate what one third of that monthly income would be and how that would trans translate into either a mortgage or a rent payment. What happened this year was sort of interesting because we had incomes go up, so the income tier, they were all uh, raised, um, and we had a year preceding this of very low interest rates. Low interest rates increase a home buyer's buying power, the amount that they can borrow, um, and then the higher incomes indicate more buying power as well. So this meant that our pricing schedule for home sales and for rents went up quite a bit. Um, we're going to have a big correction this current year because it, interest rates are going to go up um, and we will have some updated income data as well from the census numbers and so I'm, next year <laughs> could be <laughs> really different. Um, but I, I can't predict um, these things and any time I think I can, I get it wrong. So I won't, I won't predict next year at all. Um, I do want to point out that the higher income, the higher sales pricing schedule isn't always a disadvantage when incomes go up because somebody earning the same income this year as they were earning last year may now actually be in a lower income percentile category because the whole, the whole range has shifted up. So they may, at this point, qualify for a lower priced home. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, under our code, workers who are considered essential workers, so public safety, education, um, teachers, public health workers, are able to buy a home in the 80 to 100 uh, percent range, if, even if they earn over that. So we have an allowance for essential workers to be able to purchase the homes that are produced through our inclusionary zoning program. Um, on the rental side, it's, I, I don't, there's not a lot of silver linings here. I think one of the reasons that incomes went up in Santa Fe is that a lot of our lower income folks left. Um, also, uh, people with higher incomes moved in. So there we have some external factors this year that were, we always have external factors, but I think this year they were particularly pronounced. I know everyone remembers reading the articles about the Zoom boom and how people could live anywhere and have the same jobs that pay more from a different economic uh, reality. So um, for, for the uh, renters trying to afford rents, um, one, one issue here is that the, because the incomes went up, uh, we used an affordability gap measure to calculate, especially the, the fee in lieu of, which is then used to provide rental assistance for a lot of folks, or direct subsidy for affordable rental projects. Um, this gap actually got smaller, which means that the fee, the fees are, are going to be slightly less this year. Um, but I think that will be offset, of course, by the fact that as per our ordinance amendments, from a couple years ago, the fees will increase another 20% on July 1. So there's a whole sample calculation in this memo. <laughs> if you really want to put yourself to sleep, <laughs> you can read through every step of that. Um, but I will stand for questions um, and um, happy to answer any other any other questions 
about affordable housing and how we do these calculations and use this data from HUD every year to, to do this, this update. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Councilwoman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Alex, for presenting this information. Um, AMI is always this tricky thing um, for me. I just think it, it doesn't really show the big picture and you explain some of the things that this doesn't account for. Um, and then you gave an example in your report and maybe you could expound upon it because I, I guess I'm kind of confused. It's the example of the home buyer that earns $57,000, for example, in 2021 was eligible to purchase a three-bedroom home um, priced at 264000 So when you said in 2022 that the same home buyer um, with the same income is now income qualified in the 30, sorry, 65 to 80 AMI tier, and then you said the purchase price for which this buyer now qualifies is 241 So that means that they qualify l for less of the amount of a home, the 241 can you explain that difference? I, I'm confused about that because right now they're, they would be moved into a different AMI tier. Um, so what are the advantages then to be in that tier and can you explain the, the house cost? Mr. Mayor, Councillor Villarreal. So in this example, um, under last year's statistic, the three-person family earning $57,000 was income certified at approximately 90% of the area median income. This means they weren't qualified for CDBG assistance, federal grant assistance, um, community development block grant, um, and this means they were cons they were in the highest income tier. So the home that was priced in that highest income tier was the home at 264 to 250. So this year with the new data, that household's income hasn't changed because it's the same household, <laughs> this mythical household. Um, but now they are that now they're in the 65 to 80 percent income tier, so they are able to buy the home that's priced in the middle tier, as opposed to having to buy the home in the higher tier. And now they're eligible for CDBG assistance. So that so in a way, it's an advantage if you, especially if you're a household and your income is somewhat on the border between two income tiers. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. I think the the, the factor that doesn't get shown in the AMI is um, the housing stock that we're dealing with and the, uh, the cost of the home. So even if someone qualified at a, a different tier, which allows them for other um, subsidies, they're still not able to get to that higher uh, amount of housing costs so that it's like amped up even more. I don't know if you had that broken down. I think this was just AMI, but you didn't give us the median um, house price now? Is it up to 600000 now? Mr. Mayor, Councilor Villarreal, I have not looked at the m most recent statistic on that, but it was at the last quarter. Um, I think one of the points to make and one of the very powerful tools we have here in the City of Santa Fe is our inclusionary zoning program. So this pricing schedule, these homes have to sell at this price. It doesn't matter what's happening in the market. So that's why um, this is powerful, this tool is so powerful and why the pricing schedule uh, that we set using these income ranges, those, they have to be matched up. So that home buyer household is going to be able to buy a home in their affordability range. If, if the housing stock is available. Right. Mr. Mayor, Councilor Villarreal, if there is market development because that triggers the inclusionary zoning Got requirement. It. So every time when a subdivision is approved at the planning commission level, that translates into more affordable homes with price restrictions for more households. And so when the conversations in the planning commission level uh, start to talk about, well, it would be better if it was half the density, that's half the homes for people who otherwise, to your point, would not have an opportunity to buy in this market. Just had deja, deja vu right now talking about this with you in this setting. So <laughs> thank you for all the knowledge that you share with us and appreciate the new information. Thank you, Director Ladd. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Really important. This is part of an ongoing conversation about affordable housing in our community and ways to expand our 
not just our housing stock, but who can afford to live in our housing stock. So really appreciate your bringing this to us. Thank you. Thank you. Assistant City Clerk, that brings us to item 8D, if you could. This is a presentation of potential benefits and limitations of establishing a metropolitan redevelopment area at the Midtown property. Uh, City Attorney Aaron McSherry, Senior Assistant City Attorney Marcos Martinez, and Assistant City Attorney Andrea Salazar are available for presenting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the governing body. Um, I'll, I'll start off on this uh, presentation and uh, hand it off to Andrea and uh, be available to stand for any questions the governing body may have. <clears throat> so metropolitan redevelopment areas, projects, and plans. Why metropolitan redevelopment for Midtown? Well, first, because the resolution told us to look into Metropolitan Redevelopment. Resolution 2022-12 directed the city manager to make recommendations to the governing body regarding the use of an MRA and or a TID for the Midtown District. This presentation summarizes our recommendations regarding the use of an MRA. So what is a Metropolitan Redevelopment Area? Well, this is a product of the Metropolitan Redevelopment Act, which is a state statute that allows a municipality to access certain redevelopment tools in an area that is designated as a blighted area. What are the MRA redevelopment tools? First, it makes businesses within the MRA eligible for Local Economic Development Act funding. Second, it creates a commission dedicated to the planning, preservation, rehabilitation, redevelopment, development, or management of properties designated by the governing body. Third, it retains advisory oversight within the public sector. Fourth, it incorporates public engagement throughout the process. Fifth, it requires a redevelopment plan that aids in the elimination or prevention of blight or the conditions that lead to the development of blight while addressing the displacement of any persons affected by the plan. So the question is, is Midtown eligible for an MRA? An MRA is designed to improve the economic growth, health, and well-being of a blighted area with one or more of the following characteristics, many of which we find in Midtown and its surrounding areas. Deteriorated or deteriorating structures, defective or inadequate street layout, faulty lot layout in relation to size, adequacy, accessibility, or usefulness, the deterioration of site or other improvements, tax or special assessment delinquency, exceeding the fair value of the land, diversity, defective or unusual conditions of title and ownership, improper subdivision, lack of adequate housing facilities in the area, and an out-of-date or impractical planning and platting, which results in low levels of commercial and industrial activity or redevelopment. Midtown and the property surrounding Midtown have a number of these characteristics. So what would it take to designate Midtown area and its surrounding environs as an MRA? First, it would require a resolution, a resolution that would make certain findings of necessity and identify the blighted area in the local government, the city's jurisdiction, and declaring that the redevelopment of the area is in the best interest of the public. Uh, 
Um, this requires a public hearing on the resolution, uh, which would not typically be required by our resolutions, and it has some additional notice and publication requirements. Um, it would also require, well, it gives the governing body the discretion to adopt an MRA plan, um, and this would also require an additional resolution adopting the plan with notice and public hearing uh, statutory requirements. Uh, an MRA plan requires that four elements be present. It must have uh, activities that will either eliminate or prevent blight or lead to the development of a blighted area, a method to address residential displacement, if any, without undue hardship. It has to conform to the general plan of the city and it must maximize private and public redevelopment in alignment with community needs. So we would also recommend potential ordinance changes along with uh, these resolutions that would designate the MRA area and adopt a plan. We recommend for that the four factors required by state law replace the 17 elements listed under the current code to remove internal references that no longer point to existing code and add composition recommendations or qualification recommendations for the commission that would be uh, charged with overseeing and making recommendations to the governing body. And now I think I'll turn it over to Andrea. Good evening. So I'm going to talk about um, the city's historic use. So the only time that the city of Santa Fe has had or designated an MRA is in the rail yard. And the rail yard started as a designated metropolitan redevelopment area. Then a community plan was created through community engagement. And then that community plan turned into the MRA plan. The community plan and the MRA plan then turned into the rail yard master plan. So it was an evolution that happened in the rail yard. After the master plan was adopted, Instead of having the MRA overseen by a Metropolitan Redevelopment Agency and Commission, the city sought an RF, a nonprofit entity through an RFP. And they selected the nonprofit entity and entered into the lease and management agreement, which governed development in the rail yard to ensure that development was consistent with the rail yard master plan. So this use of MRA in the rail yard has both pros and cons in the rail yard. Um, I've identified several of them, and I'll go through them. So some of the pros are that the city didn't have to decide which businesses come into the rail yard. It didn't have to negotiate for development. It didn't have to exceed its regulatory authority, meaning the only role that the city has played is really being that regulatory authority. It didn't have to, I'm sorry, not the city, Developers didn't have to hand over their pro formas or their statements or their um, reports about how much they were making. Instead, that went to the nonprofit, which made it confidential. Um, local businesses and nonprofits could also thrive in the rail yard because of the ownership structure. The city retained ownership of the ground in the rail yard and some of the buildings. Then leased them out under the lease and management agreement. And because of that, it didn't accelerate in lease values in the same way that other areas in the downtown did. Cons of the rail yard are that the city didn't retain any oversight for the nonprofit's decision making, meaning the city doesn't have any authority over the board or what the development looks like or what the businesses um, are in the rail yard. And this also, com this structure complicates the ownership in the rail yard because of the the series of owners that I've talked about before, where the city owns the ground, some of the buildings, then other businesses own some of the buildings and they lease the ground from the nonprofit. This bifurcation of ownership also complicates property taxes. Um, a metropolitan redevelopment area is allowed to abate property tax up to seven years because of the retained ownership. After that, the county assessor has the right to assess the property tax on the buildings, but that comp is complicated because these are leasehold premises. And the city's regulatory authority is also complicated because the master plan is not super straightforward into how the regulation is imposed. 
So how have other cities used MRAs? Um, we really looked into two specific cities, that's Albuquerque and Las Cruces. Albuquerque has imposed MRA districts all over the city, and one that we really identified as being an interesting model was the sawmill area. Um, the sawmill area today is a quite dynamic space. It has hotels, it has businesses, it has affordable housing, it has mixed use. And so that's something that we've looked at all of the documents and the time frame for how, how long that took. Las Cruces, similar to Santa Fe, has only imposed one MRA, and that was to revitalize their downtown area. The planning in the downtown area had transformed that into not being a center of the city, and so they designated this an MRA to make it thrive and for both residents and visitors alike. So what are some of the benefits of having an MRA designation? There's potential funding sources, such as LIDA, expanded application, grant el eligibility, anti-displacement funding for specific locations within the MRA if we are displacing residents, brownfield and environmental. The grants in the brownfield aren't specific to MRA, but they are sources that we could see funding from. There's also leveraging existing opportunities, like in opportunity zones. A benefit could be the governance structure, so city control over that governance structure, over the commission and the agency, having the agency as an internal operation. Um, public participation is built into the process. There are more public meetings in order to adopt the resolution. Commission meetings are open to the public and subject to the Open Meetings Act. It also recognizes flexibility in the valuation of blighted areas. So because it is designated as a blighted area, there can be negotiation about how much you sell property for or whether you give property for certain reasons so that there is more opportunity um, to not have the same type of mer fair market value evaluation. Um, additionally, the governing body determines all land dispositions over 365 days. So if it's a permanent sale or if it's a lease that exceeds a year, the governing body would decide that. Um, and also, as Marcos identified, the plan tries to eliminate blight, addresses displacement of residents, and maximizes the opportunity for rehabilitation to accomplish the goals and purposes of the public needs. The limitations of an MRA designation are that it adds an additional labor level of approval process um, through a commission. The commission likely requires staff, so it's anticipated in the statute and in our own ordinance that an executive director could be hired and staff to support as well as consultants to move forward the development. Um, also, there's a limitation on the commission itself only being able to lease up to 365 days in their own commission. And the commission doesn't have lending or borrowing power of itself. So I'm sh gonna show you three maps um, identified by staff as potential areas to designate as an MRA. The first area is Opportunity Zone 1103 and the Midtown Link area. The Midtown Link is identified in the yellow, and in green is the 1103 Opportunity Zone. This does include residential areas as seen in the Opportunity Zone. The next map identified is a mix of the two Opportunity Zones that abut each other. So 1103 and uh, whoops, that's the wrong title, 1103, and I think it's 10, I can't quite remember the, the title. Um, but the, these are two zones that have been designated by a census track because of their census track as being opportunity zones. The last area um, that we've identified in the map is the Midtown Link area and the Franklin Miles Park. Um, so that would include all of the Midtown property that we are looking at and most of the commercial district that has link incentives in it. So to move forward with designating an MRA in this area, um, we first would have to declare blight. So the resolution would have a designation report declaring blight and identifying which area um, the governing body would like to move forward as a metropolitan redevelopment area. Then we would request 
in next steps to amend the ordinances governing the Metropolitan Redevelopment Agency and Commission so that it's aligned, city requirements are aligned with Metropolitan Redevelopment state law. And we would ask to add qualifications to the commissioners appointed to the commission. And we will stand for questions. Thank you. Um, questions? Both hands. Councilwoman Villarreal, and then we'll go this way. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. This is the third iteration of this presentation, so thank you. Um, I got most of my questions answered. The one that didn't get answered, and I think you all were going to look into it, is about how the an MRI, sorry, MRA works in unison with a community land trust. And that actual model exists in the sawmill right now, sawmill land trust um, in Albuquerque. So I was curious how they work together, um, if you know any, if you were able to get any more details about that. Mayor, Councilor Villarreal. So the, I have looked through the development agreement in the sawmill redevelopment. So the way that sawmill started was it was designated a metropolitan redevelopment area and the city owned that land um, and created a community trust, land trust with the community entity. So I haven't gone through the full details of all of the lease agreements and the agreements, but they were agreements that required there to be a certain um, price point for any homes that were sold and that the land trust itself held the land. So it's almost a, a similar situation in the rail yard where an entity holds the ground and then houses can be built either by builders or by the, the people who purchase the area. And then if they sell it, they only get the appreciated value of the, the house itself, not of the land. So the land remains with in the community trust. Um, I think we need to do a little bit deeper dive in terms of looking at how that occurred and how successful it is. Um, just haven't really had time to dig any deeper than the, the formulating documents. Thank you. Th this is of my interest for sure about how we can create a model similar to that because the community land trust in Albuquerque has been highly su successful. Sure, they've had some bumps along the road, but they've been able to maintain an area that's stayed affordable for an area that's actually really growing in Albuquerque. And that MRI, MRA is still growing and, and encompassing and using more retail development. So I guess what I'm interested in, yes, they've had a lot of different types of redevelopment in that area, but the sawmill land trust has remained affordable for traditional and long-term neighbors. So I'm, I'm interested to see how that can work for us on Midtown. Thank you. Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor Weber. Um, Councilwoman Villarreal, I just wanted to do a couple of follow-up comments. I guess it would be important to understand, I think, that a community land trust doesn't require an MRA to exist, and also um, an MRA could have a community land trust or a community land trust could be outside of an MRA. It could, they can exist either together or apart. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and then I think one of your other questions, and I think that maybe you guys discussed this at a prior, one, one of the three versions you've seen, Councilor Woman, Councilor Woman Villarreal, um, was a question about how um, an MRA could benefit residential areas. Um, and I think we, that's one of the areas we looked at. So I'm not sure if everyone heard the answer to that question. And it does seem like um, the MRA would construct would give the city more options for infrastructure improvement in areas we wouldn't typically improve otherwise. For example, if sidewalks were inadequate in a private neighborhood, if drainage was inadequate in a private neighborhood. So those might be reasons we might want to extend if outside the area of the city owned property. Those would be considerations to look at. Um, it could go either way, right? Whether we want to or we don't want to, but those would be potential advantages if there are areas that have inadequate infrastructure um, that we could improve. Um, and then one other thing I just wanted to clarify that I think was a, a point of potential confusion during when Marcus and I presented previously um, was that although the rail yard area is still a metropolitan redevelopment area, we have not retained the agency. So it started with an agency, but we don't have one anymore. So it has some of the elements from the original plan, but it doesn't have a lot of the elements that were discussed today in terms of 
the opportunities of city direct um, involvement in the development if we want to do that. Thank you. Thank you. This side of the house, questions? Councilor Mayor Worth. Okay, thank you, Mayor. You have the floor. Um, so we did hear this at finance. Um, I think we uh, had an opportunity to ask some questions. I know, I, and since we're, I think, on radio tonight, um, and we probably have a bigger audience, just want to go through a couple of things. So this designation of blight, um, there was concern at finance about calling somewhere a blighted area and that may be um, being not a, a characterization an area would like to be known as. And so my understanding from finance is that blight is a legal term uh, required by state law in designating an MRA. And maybe you can speak to that a little bit in case I'm mutilating it. Councilor Romero Worth, members of the governing body, you, you have not mutilated it, you've gotten it right. <clears throat> the term blight in the Metropolitan Redevelopment Code is a statutory term of art, and it is a necessary finding as part of that initial resolution should the governing body choose to pursue this path. And just as the governing body has pursued this path in the past, the, the city had to make a designation, a finding of blight, and that the designation of an area would aid in the elimination of blight or the conditions that caused the blighted area. I think uh, uh, City Attorney has something to add. Mayor Weber, Councilwoman Romero with, um, maybe we could show that list again. Um, it shows, it has like the eight criteria. I might have to put my password in. <laughs> well, or, or we could pull it up. So there are, and, and we think we have it in the attached presentation, but the blight um, term is is eligible with any of the eight um, criteria that were mentioned earlier, and one is just inadequate infrastructure, for example, um, that causes um, the area to not be successfully redeveloped. So it doesn't mean what maybe the common parlance of the word would mean necessarily. It could mean that as well, but it, it's a kind of a, a broad range of factors that could qualify an area for this type of designation. Yes, and to go through that list very briefly for the benefit of people on, uh, who are listening, um, it includes aspects like deteriorated structures, defective street layout. And I think this is something the city has struggled with, with how to remedy problems, accessibility to the Midtown area and the link overlay, faulty lot layout. Uh, the Midtown campus and the area has not, uh, was not planned in the same way that it would be planned today. And an MRA offers the opportunity to go back and rehabilitate or meet, bring up to the standards that are currently employed by the rest of the city in an already developed but perhaps economically depressed area of the city. Uh, going over some of these other elements are um, defective conditions of title or ownership, improper subdivision, lack of adequate housing facilities. These are the elements that go into a finding of blight. And I think uh, many times the governing body has found that uh, there, is, there is a housing issue um, in this area of town. Out of date or impractical planning or platting, which results in low level of commercial or industrial activity. So it, it is not a pejorative connotation. It is simply descriptive of a, a state of affairs. Thank you. I think that's very helpful. And I guess the other thing is, so I appreciate the city attorney talking about why you might include neighborhoods in your uh, drawing of a, of a uh, metropolitan redevelopment district. Because that was going to be my next question is, why wouldn't we just draw the district and not include the residential area? And I think we did have a conversation at finance about, you know, is there a downside to including residential areas when you have this blight determination, could you be impacting property values? And um, and I guess my other, my, so maybe you can address that, but then as a matter of, if we, 
determine an area and it includes a residential area to be having some of those factors that you just listed, does our determination of that guarantee that we're going to fix those things? And so can, can the neighborhood, you know, embrace it in a sense because they know we've identified it as um, lacking in some of these areas and it's an opportunity to fix it, but does it actually get fixed? Um, Councillor Romero, -Wirth, to answer the first part of your question, um, we did reach out to Albuquerque because of their extensive use of the MRAs to pose the question about residential property values. They didn't have sort of a formal set of statistics that we could look at, but it, it, anecdotally what they said was it's, it doesn't affect either negatively or po positively uh, property values. In other words, it, it tends to even out over the, over the time of the MRA area, the agency's actions, and the development that occurs under uh, the commission that Albuquerque employs. Uh, to an the second question that you posed I think is more difficult for us to guarantee, but I, I will say that the plan requires that the activities that the city commits to within the MRA must be designed to address the problems that either have, that result in blight or that have caused the blight. So, so the plan and the commission are, are, are entities, are, well the plan is um, something that exists in order to remedy those problems and the commission's sole purpose is to address the blighted area or those, those factors that have caused the blight conditions to occur. Uh, they are not charged with other, other, any other um, statutory um, goals. So they are focused solely on the redevelopment and remedying the problems of blight. Okay, thank you. I want to go to page 11 of 15 on this. We, you talked about limitations of an MRA designation. And the first limitation was an additional layer of approval processes through the commission. Just curious, additional to what? What's the first layer? Is that us? And then if we do this, then we have a layer on top of us or beneath us or I, I don't, who's the additional layer? What's? Thank you, uh, Councilor Romero. We're with members of the governing body for the question. Um, I think what we mean is we don't have an active agency right now and an active commission. We could not, if the governing body were to designate an MRA first, uh, the commission would make recommendations, and so that is a process, a public process, that um, a developer would have to go through, city staff would have to go through before coming back to the governing body for final approval. Um, that would be for any kind of um, duty that is non-delegable to the commission. So there are some small um, powers that the governing body can delegate to the commission, but mostly they would be recommending, making evaluations. It would be within their expertise to, to sort of um, tee up proposals or projects to the governing body for final approval. Okay, so they'd be, so under that description, they'd be under us making recommendations to us. Um, and your presentation singled out the rail yard and we started as an M MRA there, but that's not what happens with the rail yard. And I, I think this is an, an educational moment about how the rail yard operates because people I think do get confused um, that if we went with the pure form of this MRA, we wouldn't designate, we wouldn't, uh, uh, what's the right word, uh, delegate our authority as the governing body to make those decisions the way we have done in the rail yard. And, and you had said earlier that, you know, we, we can't control a lot of what goes on there. Uh, and in fact, uh, sometimes there's not a lot of communication about what's going on there. But this would be wholly different if we were to kind of stick with the pure form of this because the commission 
would be reporting to us and we would be making final decisions, which is not what happens at the rail yard. Yes, yeah, that is correct. Okay. Um, I think you said, and, and I just want to restate it, this idea about community development trusts, this, this doesn't preclude them, I think is what the city attorney said in, a diff in different words. Um, but it's some, we can do this and still do a community development trust. They're not mutually exclusive. Absolutely. And that, that goes for other, some of the other financing mechanisms that we've identified, uh, TIDs and PIDs. Those, those are all can be complementary to an MRA. Okay, and then finally, I want to talk about sawmill. And I think you said uh, maybe you, so sawmill in Albuquerque. I did have the opportunity to be there recently uh, for the Van Gogh exhibit. Uh, I got to tell you, if you haven't seen the exhibit or you haven't been in that area, fascinating to have watched what's going on there and how it's come, come about. It is very vibrant. It is very mixed use. Uh, in my mind, an incredible success, um, and I've seen it over the last, I, I don't know, I, I want to say, I mean, it's probably been 10 years and seen it kind of coming piecemeal, and I hadn't been down there in a while. But that goes to my point of how long did that take, uh, and where are they in that process? Like, is there still, are they still, uh, is there still more to do in their development plan? Uh, Mayor Councilor Romero Worth. So I believe that the MRA was designated in 1992. So that is the first part of this. Um, and it's still moving forward. So there are still parcels of land when you're around there that are inactive. And so they're still in the process of developing it. Um, who, you know, the rail yard likewise took a, a while to, to come to fruition. So. Sawmill has gone through that entire process from the 90s to today, um, and it's still in process. Okay. I, I just think it's a, it's a great example um, of, I don't know, I tend to be a visual person, so it helps me understand what you're talking about through uh, this concept and um, also kind of understanding what we started to do right with the rail yard and maybe how we can improve and learn from uh, how that has gone and what we want to see as we look at Midtown. Um, and I guess that's really all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Lindell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, what other choices do we have other than MRA? I mean, it seems like we've got one choice here that we're putting all of our efforts into. What would be some other choices that we might compare this to or take a look at? Um, Council Lindell, uh, members of the governing body, I'll, I'll begin, um, but this governing body al already considered one path of trying to redevelop Midtown, as you know, through the RFEI process. Um, and I think as we got through the initial agreement with the developers, um, they began to identify many of the problems that were in that list of a blight designation as stumbling blocks before they could, they were prepared to develop the property. So one model would be to pursue that again, you know, do, try to do a better job uh, of uh, an RFP for a master developer for the process. So that's always going to be an option. I think the rail yard itself um, could be another option, um, but it poses its own you know, drawbacks and, and advantages, perhaps. And there are um, probably a, no no another, a number of ways the city could uh, employ existing incentives, the link overlay was an attempt, early attempt to try to incentivize development in that area. Um, but Andrea or Aaron, I don't know if you have. I think what we're really talking about is what development path you want. You could parcel out the land and start selling it. You could sell it to one developer. Um, you could do an MRA so that you have this mix of being able to put public infrastructure money 
into the land so that you have both private and public entities. You could make it a complete public entity project. I mean, there are a lot of different possibilities, but the reason we've identified this as being a very good possibility is because when we were negotiating with the, the master developer at the time, they had given us numbers of, of infrastructure costing $30 million and please give us potentially this amount of money so we could move forward. And we really didn't have that vehicle to do that. What the MRA does is it allows the city to put in infrastructure and also utilize LIDA to make catalyst projects on the campus. So you can have a business catalyst that starts to grow and then utilize other parcels for different reasons like housing or local businesses. And so it gives you that base. It doesn't preclude any financing tools as Marcos was talking about like SAD districts or PIDs or TIDs. So you're able to both utilize public funds for infrastructure and have other finance tools and bonding mechanisms in it. And you can sell it and use it for different purposes. So that's really why we're looking at this is because it gives us a diversity of options and a bunch of redevelopment tools that we wouldn't otherwise have. You, uh, thank you. You started out by saying uh, approximately $30 million in infrastructure. How does the uh, MRA address that? Uh, Councilor Lindell, so I will say that the $30 million, we never understood where that came from. That was just a number that was thrown out there. So there's, there's nothing that we have currently that says that's the number for this. But I guess the, the short answer is that we would be able to put infrastructure in. I don't know what that cost is, but you could use bonding functions or other TID functions to put that infrastructure in so that people could start doing the vertical build. We would be doing the horizontal, which we talked a lot about, you know, about a year ago, putting that horizontal infrastructure in, um, trails, streets, fiber, uh, utilities, all of that in the ground so that businesses and housing could start building up from there. So this allows us to have that mechanism. I think the city attorney has an additional comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to build on a couple points. Um, MRA does not give us a new funding source. That's true. Um, it does give us some flexibility for private developers, which is the LIDA that Andre was talking about, and it gives us more flexibility about what we want to prioritize with our funding, whatever we decide to do. Um, and it doesn't preclude any of the funding sources we would have otherwise. Um, there was one other point, I think. So it, it gives us more rights. It gives us potentially more flexibility um, that is recognized at a state level that we might not otherwise have. Thank you. I still, um, you know, it may be that um, 30 million is not the number. It could be 60. It could be 20. We don't know. But we're, with this kind of project, with this kind of um, framework, being asked to commit massive amounts of money to this project that we we're into this project pretty good already um, I, I would really um, need to have a, a complete financial analysis of what this means uh, to the city because I, I I mean it all looks great here this looks you know terrific but we're going to be asked to put some very, very sizable money into this project. Um, one of the things I, I don't really understand about this is the commission leasing authority limited to 365 days. Is that, uh, is that the situation at the sawmill in Albuquerque? Um, Council Lindell, I, I don't know specifically if it is, but it is a restriction imposed by the statute. And that just means that the, any leases that go over the, a year have to go to the governing body of the city of Albuquerque. And likewise with, with the city of Santa Fe, should, should there be an MRA, 
any leases in excess of one year would have to be approved by this body. I think it's really hard to um, lease property when you ask people to put in, be it tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Um, I think it's very, very hard to offer a one-year lease. That, that's highly unlikely that um, people would, a business would find that acceptable. Um, I'm just concerned about the financing with this. It all looks so great, and so everybody loves Sawmill, but we've got a lot of work to do to look at the financing of this before, um, for me, I'm able to support this. Mayor Weber, can I comment on the financing part? Yes, uh, Mayor Weber, Council Lindell. Um, I guess I just want to clarify one other thing is that the city could still um, improve infrastructure on its own land without an MRA. I think the only difference in terms of the rights for Im improvement would be on the private land. Um, so we, there still might be a city proposal to do infrastructure improvement regardless of an MRA one way or the other. So it doesn't, it doesn't automatically come with new financial obligations is I guess what I'm trying to say other than potentially staff time dedicated to a commission. Um, so that, that would be the, the probably the, fit, the required fiscal impact would be staff time dedicated to the commission to comprise the agency. But there's no requirement of spending city funds if you designate an MRA. There does have to be a plan, but the plan could be leveraging private funds. It could be leveraging these tax mechanisms that were mentioned. Um, that, that c we don't know what the plan would be, but the commission would have to recommend a plan that would address all those points. So that, that plan might include city financing, but it would be subject to governing body approval, whatever the plan includes. So just, just seeking an MRA doesn't automatically um, commit anyone to infrastructure improvements. It gives you some more flexibility as to how you can make those improvements should you decide to make them. Thank you. Uh, so those are the things that I would like to have more specific answers to and also do we have anything else that we would like to compare this to or is this our one and only plan at this point in time. So I guess Mayor Weber, Council Lindell, on that point, I was I had a thought. Um, another question I received in the last few weeks is, um, could the city just create a different type of development arm internally? And the answer I think is yes. That's another option. It would not have the, these extra rights that are granted if we did it without the MRA, but we could do it, um, and it would it could still have whatever parameters we wanted to give that type of agency or commission that is not an MRA but is something else. It just wouldn't have the additional LIDA flexibility. It wouldn't have the additional private infrastructure flexibility, um, that type of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Councilor Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just uh, listening to all the comments. Um, going back to the investment that we've, we've already started on, um, the community outreach, uh, the entities that are coming up with the idea of what goes at Midtown and what um, professional opinions are there as to which avenue and options. As, as, as you mentioned, Councillor, um, um, Councillor <laughs> Lindell, I'm sorry. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're already in this and we're starting to invest quite a bit um, to get to that point and so we need to know what is the best avenue once we come up with the recommendations from the community outreach and what's what where we want to go with is this it um, you know I, I've been in favor of uh, taking a look at how how we do lease out part of the property and retain the value of it ourselves over time um, and at the same time uh, there may be areas that can be sold, but I mean, you piecemeal it in a sense to what, what makes best for the whole project overall and what makes best sense for uh, the city. And so um, those are my comments and I, I would like to, you know, a little more insight on um, where we're at right now as far as the recommendations and once that comes out, which is gonna be the best avenue for us to take based upon legal, based upon um, future, uh, um, 
what's best for the city, in other words, and that's just my, my question. To go, Councillor Garcia, Mayor, I, to go through that kind of quickly, so the MRA would be one specific plan. That doesn't mean it's um, not the community plan or the master plan. So we have a lot of plans that we're talking about, which probably is quite confusing. But the community plan, which is being drafted up and finalized um, to be presented, will talk about what the values and the goals of the community are for their engagement. The second piece of that is changing of the general plan, meaning the general plan currently says that it's an institutional use, and so we have to change that designation in order to create any type of different use on the property. It also is in tandem with our master plan, which identifies using the, the community plan and um, financial tools and analysis to designate how the flow and structure of the master plan should be, so there's a couple different plans. But what this does is it's almost like a governance um, and designation to allow development once those other plans have been created. So it gives a little bit more of an economic ability to thrive and stabilize. So it is a, it's a different thing and it, it, it is kind of complicated in how many different tools we're utilizing. But the, in the background, the consulting teams, when we're looking at the MR analysis, this isn't just the three of us looking at it. We're utilizing our consultant, Strategic Economics, who we've discussed this with, our bond counsel, Peter Franklin, we've been meeting with the state, with economists. There's a lot of different people we've been talking about this with, and the reasons why this could be beneficial, and why it doesn't preclude options, but it does include options. I don't know if that's, that totally answers your question, but. Well, it, yeah, it clarifies um, a, a few of uh, what I've been, you know, thinking about all of this going on at Midtown. However, um, you know, I think you mentioned or somebody mentioned uh, 1992 is when Sawmill started. <laughs> and, you know, we're, you know, we're far down the road. Uh, we're 2022 now. And what's the foresight of um, this project uh, 20 years from now? And I know it doesn't happen overnight, and there's a lot of pieces to this, um, from development code to financing to everything. And so, um, again, based upon your professional opinions and what works, uh, I just don't want to be five years from now, and um, you know we're back at square one again. And so that's that's a big loss for us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Others? Very good. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Assistant City Clerk, I believe the next item is E on our agenda. Final presentation is FY21 audit status update. Interim Assistant Finance Director Ricky Bejarano is here to present. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of, members of the Council. In terms of uh, progress made so far, we, the city and our city manager, the mayor, myself, uh, Director Lotero met with the Office of the State Auditor and um, the Department of Finance Administration New Mexico. We had a very productive meeting. The outcome was that they wanted to start with an initial plan. Uh, they presented a number of items that were presented to them by CLA. The former auditors and it, with the idea that perhaps they would return to the audit if we could demonstrate that we completed these items. There were 26 items on the list. We have completed the plan. It will be submitted to the state auditor's office and DFA as well shortly. And then the outcome from that will be we'll regroup and go through the items and then potentially CLA would return to the audit. In terms of the timeline, uh, most items look to be about July 15th is a realistic date for the items requested. I want to point out that we had already submitted hundreds of items beyond the 26 items that were requested additionally. 
Uh, so the progress that had been made up to that point is not lost. It will continue. We're continuing to make progress with the overall audit requirements. And uh, a part of this timeline also will include SWAMA and BDD. Uh, both have requested to be uh, ext extricated from our books so that in the future their audits can go on regardless of what's happening with the city. It's a very good idea, in my opinion. They never should have been um, incorporated into the city's books to begin with. And so we'll, part of the plan that we'll submit will be a timeline for extricating those two entities from the city so that they can be standalone, they can have their own charts of accounts. And regardless of what happens with the city, uh, their audits can proceed, but the reverse is also true in the future. If, if something is going on with those entities, it won't slow the city down as well. We plan a meeting tomorrow with Councillor Romero Worth, our legal staff, and Nancy Long, who is the attorney for both SWAMA and BDD, to discuss that process. It is a long-term proposition. Uh, our timeline, we're probably looking at the end of fiscal year 2023. Uh, in terms of other items that the state auditor inquired about uh, was vacancies. Um, we have some real significant vacancies that we have. Uh, we have advertised for a new controller. Uh, today the advertisement for the Treasury Office should be posted. Our grants manager position should be filled within a couple of weeks. We've received the listing for that of the people that have applied. And then we're also working on a job description for a compliance officer that would be responsible for overall compliance across the city. Uh, the other item that the auditor was very interested in is an RFP so the progress can continue into the 22 audit so that we still have an opportunity to submit the 22 audit on time. That RFP will be issued May 31st. Uh, bids are required to be in by June 24th, and the potential award should be uh, granted by July 1st. And with that, I stand for questions. Thank you. Questions about the audit at the moment? Very clear. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, Assistant City Clerk. We had nothing taken off of consent. Uh, I believe that brings us then to matters from the city manager. Am I correct? Mr. Blair, do you have things you'd like to bring to our attention? Mr. Mayor, city councilors, uh, good evening. Uh, nice to see you all in person again. Um, I won't go over audits of as well since Mr. Badon did a good job of that. Um, I'll flag for you that uh, I went to Indianapolis last week along with seven of our staff members from the City of Santa Fe team to a conference uh, held by Tyler Munis, which is the software system that we use right now for our HR and finance needs. Um, it was a really productive few days. There were 7,000 uh, staffers from various municipalities across the country there attending, taking classes learning how to use the systems better, being introduced to new features that will be available in the future. It was really productive, I think, for our team to be there, both for a couple of reasons, one of which is to see that there are a lot of cities in the country right now that who use Munis that are in the middle of an upgrade, and there's a lot of fear, and there's some nervousness around it, and that we're not the only ones in the country going through this upgrade that we're going through. The second thing was really for them to get to see some of the features that are gonna be provided for in the new upgrade, that are really gonna allow for increased efficiencies in how we do our business, how we communicate internally, and how we respond with the public um, with our HR and finance needs. So it's pretty exciting to see that happening. We are working towards an implementation of our new MUNA system in January of 2023. That's the current estimate of when we'll go live with the new system. And we're actually meeting internally tomorrow with a group of our stakeholders um, to discuss uh, mapping out a training program for all of the staff who, who utilize Munis and integrate with it, um, rather than just saying, hey, there's trainings, go get them. 
we're going to provide an outline for all staff that utilizes the system and have some accountability there. So we're checking throughout the next few months. Uh, the system is set up so there are options for staff to go in and play in a hypothetical scenario where they can test out the features, see what it wor uh, how it works, what the features do, without fear that they're going to mess up our books or HR sort of stuff. So there's a lot of opportunities here. We're excited about how that, uh, again, will improve the way we uh, do our work here, but also how it will help us make sure that our audits are done correctly and, and on time in the future. Um, I will flag for you that as we're seeing in the news with regard to New Mexico and with Santa Fe specifically, we have seen an uptick in the number of uh, city employees who are testing positive for COVID. Uh, we are continuing to comply with the New Mexico Department of Health to ensure that we are reporting those within four hours of being notified. Uh, we continue to work with staff with regard to wearing a mask, social distancing, and how, how to navigate uh, this new scenario where we may be moving from pandemic to endemic um, at some point in the future. As part of this, we are working on implementing a new remote work policy that will extend beyond this COVID pandemic. Um, we are working to finalize that now and get it out to our unions for their uh, blessing and approval uh, before we put that into place. Um, but we are continuing to encourage everyone to be on their best behavior with regard to COVID. And if you don't feel well, please make sure you get tested and you stay home when needed. Um, beyond that, I just want to flag real quick that uh, while we weren't the planners of it, we are really proud of this amazing literary festival that happened here at the Convention Center this last weekend. Um, I can just tell you anecdotally saw a significantly larger number of people in and around Santa Fe, up and down St. Francis Drive as early as Saturday morning. Um, lots of people eating in restaurants, lots of people staying in hotels. Um, and I just want to commend our staff on the Convention Center, Economic Development, uh, our parking team, who worked really hard to ensure that the people of Santa Fe had a really seamless uh, event and something we could be proud of. So we're really excited about that. I'll flag that was also one of many, many events in Santa Fe that the city of Santa Fe was involved in over the weekend. Um, and I know that our communications team is doing a lot of work right now to push out all the summer activities that are going on and in light of what's happening uh, with the Hermit Speak Fire and other sort of uh, measures uh, about fire safety. We want to ensure that we're doing all we can to make sure the people of Santa Fe realize all the fun free activities they can do within the city limits, our urban trails, um, et cetera. So we'll have a lot more information that we're going to push out to you and hope that you can push out to your constituencies as well. Okay. And then the last thing is just a flag for you that June is Pride Month. And in the city of Santa Fe, we are celebrating that the last week of June. Uh, the Santa Fe Pride Parade is going to be June 25th. That's a Saturday. Uh, I think historically we've had police have an entry and the fire have had an entry. We're going to try to have a, um, an entry so that all queer employees or folks affiliated with the city of Santa Fe and their allies can participate and march with us. So we'll have more information for you about that down the road. The meeting time is 11 a.m. at the PERA building. Uh, the parade starts at 11.30 and ends about a half, after, half hour after that. Um, but again, we'll have more information for you about that. And Mr. Mayor, that's all I have tonight. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm looking at the clock. It's 6.36. We're talking about an executive session, and then we're talking about people coming back who wanted to do uh, petitions from the floor at 7. Um, interesting time issue. Mr. Blair, you have a thought. Mr. Mayor, I might recommend that we move forward with a matter from the city attorney um, and then see where we are. I know that our city clerk is coming to join us here in a bit of time, but I'm not sure how long the city attorney thinks the executive session may last. Mayor Weber, counselors, I don't anticipate it being very long. Um, 20 minutes is probably a little bit ambitious but it, I don't think it'll be. Let's see what we can, let's, tr let's give right. it a shot. Let's give it a shot. Okay. So Madam City Attorney, the, it's uh, item number 12 on our agenda is matters from you and I believe you have a recommendation. Mayor Weber, that's correct. I do recommend we go into executive session under the Open Meetings Act section 1015 part H5, discussion of bargaining strategy preliminary to certain collective bargaining negotiations. Uh, Councillor Lindell or Councillor Merriworth, would you like to make a motion? I'll recognize Councillor Merriworth. 
Okay, we're missing uh, Councilor Rivera tonight, who usually does this. He's our and, single point and, of failure. Yeah, and he, and he never trained anybody else, so oh, we have I'll, I'll muddle through. Um, we don't have a see. bench. I know it's one of these. Uh, threatening or pending litigation, that's the one, right? No. No. Oh. Which one do I want? Bargaining strategy. Ah, hey, uh, collective bargaining HI. strategy. Yeah? Yes. All right, so I move that we enter into executive session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, section 10-15-1H, subpart five, for the discussion of bargaining strategy preliminary, preliminarily to collective bargaining negotiations. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Roll call, all right, please call the roll. Um, may I first ask who second? It was Councillor Cassett, for the record. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Travis? Yes. Councillor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor um, Romero Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Can I vote yes too? Councillor Cassett. Oh, Councillor Cassett, I'm sorry. It's okay, yes. All right, we are uh, gonna take time, hopefully be back as close to 7 p.m. as possible. If you're listening, uh, please jo rejoin us roughly right around 7 p.m. Thank you.
Uh, yes, Mayor. Let's see. Uh, <clears throat> I let's see. Sorry, I'm reading all these instructions. Uh, I move that pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, Section 10-15-1J, uh, that the governing body reconvene an open session and state for the record that the matters discussed in the closed session were limited to those specified in the motion for closure. Is there a second? second. Councilor Lindell has seconded the motion. Uh, Madam Assistant City Clerk, would you please call the roll? We could do a voice roll on this one, Mayor. Oh, I keep, well, it's a 50-50 chance and I keep <laughs> guessing wrong. <laughs> Never send me to call the coin flip if you're in a football game. Uh, in that case, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Uh, the motion carries. Now, I, I, I was going to suggest that we change the order of business so that we go immediately to petitions from the floor. Uh, not everybody who was here earlier who was told to come back at 7 has made it back, but um, I'll look to my colleagues on the governing body. Should we change the agenda and go to petitions right now as we advertised? Okay, I'll entertain a motion that we move to petitions from the floor and then after that resume the regular order of, of the agenda. Second. There's a motion and there's a second. Um, looking for guidance on whether that's a voice vote or it's a voice vote. All in favor say aye. aye. All right. Those opposed say nay. Motion carries. All right, so what I would like to say at this time is we have some public hearings in the future in, on this agenda still uh, and public comment on some matters. If you are here for those, please withhold your comment now. If you have anything else you would like to bring to the attention of the governing body, uh, this would be the time to come to the podium and uh, the uh, assistant city clerk will give you two minutes to speak about any item you wish to address at this time. So if you're here for a, just to speak your piece, uh, please do so now. Don't be shy. Please just go over to the microphone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council people for the opportunity to have a voice. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Lindell, because you represent the part of the world from which I'm a citizen. <laughs> but So I'm not quite understanding the framework here because okay. whether it's the same as public com comment, but I, my name is Ellis Bedard Voorhees. I live at Pine Street. And I have questions based on what's been in the press about the dog park. So my questions are, uh, to my understanding from uh, Councilman Jamie, that uh, due diligence is underway with issues of the dog park. And I have a few questions. And one would be, has that process been completed? And the other question is, where will the information be made uh, given to the public regarding the due diligence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're not, we don't do Q&A. We'll just take your comments now and try to get back to you at a later date. Thank you. Thank you. Other people who wish to speak, please step up to the microphone. Give us your name and uh, take as much of the two minutes as you want. Uh, good evening. My name is Carla Harvey, K-A-R-L-A-H-A-R-B as in boy Y. I live in District 1. I just want to let you know that the Zoom login credentials for the meeting tonight are not functional. And I'm a pretty tech-savvy person, but I couldn't get it to go. So I want you to know that because there are a lot of dog park advocates who were planning to use that mechanism to interact with all of you tonight. And they, of course, were not able to do that. So just because they're not here doesn't mean they don't care. I just wanted to let you know that. I appreciate what I've heard about the city doing some due diligence on the Garcia land donation. That's fantastic. I want to echo what my neighbor Alice has to say. Uh, we need to know how that comes out and have those reports available eventually. That's something we would like. And the final thing I'd like to say, I think you know by now 
The dog park is a very heavily used facility. I have been going out there and counting the cars in the parking lot. It is not uncommon for me to count upwards of 50 cars, 40 to 50 cars. And then a couple hours later, there's a whole new set of 40 to 50 cars, depending on the day and, of course, on the weather. So just please do keep that in mind. I also provided some written comments for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Anyone else uh, and, and at this time on any matter uh, from the floor? Okay, in that case, uh, recognizing that some people may have been misguided and thought they could uh, do Zoom, we apologize for that. That feature is not available at this time, and we're not in a hybrid capability until the month of June. But we certainly will always accept written comments at any time. It doesn't have to be during this time. And uh, we'll take into consideration all of that input. Uh, that said, then, um, Assistant City Clerk, I guess we have completed the, um, the uh, petitions from the floor. Can we resume the regular order of business? Yes, Mayor. Um, the next is matters from the City Clerk, and I can report on her behalf. Please do. Thank you. Um, we just want to acknowledge that redistricting public hearings are still going on. There are two more in person. Um, we've been sending out weekly reminders in English and Spanish, uh, social media ads. There will be an ad in the paper in June. And um, announcements will be coming for the Santa Fe Summer Event Series. And that's all we have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, communications from the governing body. Uh, let me start, Councillor Garcia, with you. Thank you, Mayor. I just, um, again, thoughts and prayers go out to you know the families in Texas. Um, very difficult to lose so many people, and uh, and um, prayers to their families who have to cope with this and deal with this for long term. And um, thoughts and prayers to all of our people out. Uh, in Las Vegas and Mora, Cleveland, Holman, uh, Pecos, and um, you know, we're thinking about them, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Cassett? Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, the, the shooting that happened in Texas, I've been trying to find the words how to express my frustration and anger that this is still happening and what it's like to be a parent of a small child in this day and age and to have that thought in the back of your head every time you drop them off at school is this going to be the day that the unthinkable happens and you know we protect ourselves we we come up with reasons why it won't be us why it won't be our town why it won't be this school but what we have seen throughout the many, many years, I, I mean, I can't even name all of them. We are getting to the point that I do not even remember the name of every single school where children have been murdered, where they were supposed to be going to get an education. I don't think condolences are enough anymore. I know that at this level, there are maybe very nothing that we can do or very limited that we, we can do but you know we do have very powerful voices that we have access to people that most people do not have direct access to and I think that that is really important one thing that Councillor Chavez and I will be doing this weekend along with representative Linda Serrato and school board member Sasha Anderson is we will be having a community meeting at Martin Luther King Park at 10 a.m. on Saturday uh, it will be an opportunity for the community to come and discuss this issue and how we protect our kids in Santa Fe, um, as well as we are working on gathering resources for how people can find ways to cope. I know that my friends as parents, many of my friends as teachers, my mother, 
who was a kindergarten teacher here in Santa Fe Public Schools for 28 years. The way that this hits this in a, that it hits them and us in a almost real fear, when it becomes this real possibility and kind of this reminder. And, and I don't know if we just, we got used to it not happening because we were all in COVID. And hey, what a, what a weird silver lining to have to talk about that there weren't that many mass shootings because we were all on lockdown. Um, and now it is a reality that we have to face again. So my heart goes out to those parents that lost their kids. It is the most unimaginable thing that could possibly happen. And I just urge us all to find where our ability is to keep our kids safe, to make sure that they can go to school, they can get an education, they can learn how to make friends, they can have their first crush, they can fail their first test, they can do all of those really important developmental things safely and grow up and live a full life. And I, again, I just, my heart goes out to these families and um, I urge us all to, to see where action, where action can be taken. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Mayor Ward. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I don't have anything tonight. Councilor Lindell. Councilor Amanda Chavez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have two kids that are at an elementary school. So this has made me feel many intense feelings and unfortunately it's not the first time I've felt this way. I also have fear taking my kids to the movies or to the store when the thought hits my mind of what has occurred over the last few years. Um, I also, my other job is me dedicated to making sure kids are safe and have bright futures. And we have this, or I have to question myself as if I really have any control in that because it seems like we're not doing enough. Um, I think I've felt guilt over the last 24 hours about not being louder about this issue, um, especially when it comes to our children. Um, we are the voice of those kids. We're the ones that know the world and the ugly parts of the world and the dangers we're the only ones that could speak to protect them. And I will say I have not done enough because it's happened again. Um, well, the adults that are there to protect these kids have not done enough. That's all of us, that's leadership, that's those who have the coping skills and the experience to be more vocal and to do more. Um, you know, I'm very grateful for State Representative Serrato and um, Councilor Cassett. They invited me to the event on Saturday and it's to have a discussion. I know we're a local government, but I'm hoping that we could do more to contribute to this very needed action. Um, it's action, you know, at this point, saying sorry, um, saying, you know, wishing for prayers, hoping for better. It's kind of becoming an, an old story and a problem we're not solving. Um, so, you know, I am full of emotion, as you can tell. Um, because some of the ages that were released from the shooting yesterday are kids that are my son's age. And knowing what those parents went through is heavy. Um, so I am choosing to be loud and not to be scared about what other people think about my opinion and my passion in wanting to keep kids safe, wanting to keep the community safe, I'm advocating for things that matter like mental health, but also immediate preventative things that we can do. Um, mental health initiatives are gonna take long. Um, it's a huge problem and it's been present for so long, but there's immediate action that needs to be taken. And I don't know the answer, but I'm definitely gonna make some noise in finding out. And as adults that are here to set a path and a future for our kids, I hope that others in the community join me um, in doing what they can to make sure that we decrease the possibility of this occurring again. And it's sad, like 
It's sad to not be able to say that it's possible to eliminate it. It's scary. Um, so at least let's do something to decrease that. Um, but I hope you join us on Saturday. I hope you bring ideas. Um, I hope you bring passion and anger and sadness and all the real feelings we're feeling um, because it's going to be that vulnerability that's going to motivate us to be brave enough to say what needs to be said and to do what needs to be, um, the steps that need to be taken. Um, so I hope to hear from you because it's definitely, um, the answer is not clear, but um, together I think that we could start coming up with ways of getting somewhere so we could feel better about the world we're bringing our kids up in. Because like as a mother, I do not feel good about it. Um, and that's very hard for me to say as a leader. So I know that's very honest tonight. <laughs> I promised myself I would be very honest tonight um, for my own kids. So thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Villarreal. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I think the all of us, it's just been a hard week, weeks in general, and the shootings in Old Valde, Texas, um, it's unfathomable that we have to keep having these tragedies that continue to affect innocent children um, and be children being murdered. And this one hits home pretty close. Um, a family friend of ours, her cousin and two family members were killed. And I haven't really thought about this today because it's been so hard. <laughs> and I agree we can do more. I also feel better about how our elected officials approach gun violence in New Mexico. I feel like we, at least in Santa Fe, we are a bubble, but I do think that people take it seriously. And I just, there is more we can do. I'm just, a lot of people are grieving right now. So I'm just glad we don't have the Texas officials, the way they're communicating about this loss. It's just despicable. So um, the other thing I wanted to say is the fires in Mora have just been like hearing stories of friends of mine that have lost property and animals and just really hor horrific situations. And so I've asked staff whenever that time comes, if it, hopefully it won't come, but if there's a need for us to be able to utilize um, the Midtown campus or any of our resources, if FEMA jumps in and asks us about supporting that effort for people that are displaced that don't have homes at all and ha do not and cannot stay in Glorietta and there aren't hotels necessarily that we would step up to be able to support that. And I, I know staff is supportive of that. They just have to get direction from FEMA so thank you for responding to that, um, Director Williams back there. <laughs> and um, the other thing is just talking to friends of mine in Mora and Las Vegas, they were saying money is more important to donate than goods and water and all that, although that's also important. But I did ask about organizations to support, and one of them, two that were mentioned that were really getting resources out to the community is good, the Good Samaritan House in Las Vegas and also the Las Vegas Community Foundation. And those are two that actually are like getting out the money instead of just, you know, there's a lot, we don't want bureaucracy to prevent people from being able to be supported. Um, and then lastly, on a positive note, just wanted to wish my partner, Brandon Snowy, um, a very happy birthday. He had a birthday last week and was just happy to celebrate another year um, with him. And so I'm just thankful for him to have him in my life. So thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just say a few things about the events of the last too much, too long. Uh, it wasn't 10 days ago that there was a mass shooting in Buffalo. Uh, and now we have uh, the tragedy in an elementary school. Uh, the data are just shocking. Uh, for every 100 Americans, there are 120 guns in our country. The Gun Violence Archive tracks mass shootings, and according to their database, over 230 mass shootings have taken place in our nation in 2022. 230. 
And among those 230, 30 of the shootings have taken place in our schools. Uh, here in New Mexico, there is a uh, state constitutional law that says that local government cannot have a gun uh, restriction any stronger than what the state does. Is it a constitutional or an a, 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 a statute? Mayor Weber, it's a constitutional limitation on local governments. Yes. So you know, when people ask us why aren't we doing things that we ought to do, uh, we are preempted from so many of the things that our, my colleagues on the governing body have already said they want to do, they would do, we could do, and yet by constitutional uh, constraint we are prevented from doing. That doesn't mean we won't explore every avenue to make a difference when it comes to gun buyback programs, to gun locks, to gun safes, to uh, as uh, Councillor Chavez has said, mentoring, intervention in people's lives, more attention to uh, keeping guns out of the hands of people who have no business having them, uh, and um, exploring every avenue available to us despite that constitutional uh, issue. If you want to uh, make a statement in addition to participating in the gathering on Saturday, uh, this weekend, or the weekend of June 3 through 5, is Wear Orange Weekend. Uh, it is part of a national movement to uh, say that we've had enough of gun violence and we're going to stand together and speak up and speak out uh, about all the changes that need to be made from the federal level to the state level and then permitting the cities, if the state won't do it, to have the authority that we need in order to take the steps that we deem responsible. It's, it's a moment for the state of New Mexico to lead, to follow, or to get out of the way. Uh, there are other issues that we've all touched on already. The fires uh, being high on everybody's minds, as well as COVID. The uh, city manager has accurately said that COVID cases are spiking. None of us should take this for granted. Uh, it is a very hard disease, and it is desirable for all of us to take the steps we need to safeguard everybody in our community so that we don't see more COVID spread, nor do we want to see more fire spread. And for that reason, uh, the next a couple days, probably Saturday morning, I will be signing an emergency proclamation that will bring us into a complementary order with the federal and county uh, restrictions on access to trails uh, inside the city of Santa Fe that lead to the, fo the forest. We'll be uh, prohibiting grilling and outdoor cooking facilities uh, being used in our parks and recreation sites and specifying trails and trail systems that will be closed to the public. Uh, very simply, we are dealing with an extraordinary situation. Uh, the risks are extremely high, not just from the fires that already are surrounding us, uh, but from the inadvertent activity that could spark a fire inside the city. And so as we face unprecedented fire dangers, we need to take extra precautions. I'll sign that order, um, prepare for it, and then we'll be asking the governing body to come back into a special meeting on Tuesday morning at 10.30 to extend it because of the limitations of the uh, emergency order's uh, duration. We should end on some better notes. Uh, we've had some extremely uh, exciting uh, times in Santa Fe lately. For those of you who had a chance to listen to the former ambassador to Ukraine, Ambassador Yovanovitch, speaking to a uh, audience of what is what used to be the Council on International Relations and is now Global Santa Fe. 
she was inspiring. She was brilliant. Uh, this is a woman whose commitment to our country and to foreign service has been decorated and documented, uh, and her courage in the face of uh, having her reputation besmirched has been nothing short of uh, beyond uh, the, the annals of profiles and courage. She is a woman we should all admire for her, her heroism and her patriotism. The Literary Festival was a joy. I didn't get to go to any of it, but by all accounts it was uh, a tremendous success and uh, already there's discussion about next year and uh, what kind of literary individuals and what kind of outreach into the community uh, year two of the Literary Festival could bring. Uh, the Santa Fe Century kicked off at 7 a.m. Sunday morning and bicyclists were everywhere uh, as part of the ongoing celebration of Santa Fe as a great place to race and bike and be outdoors in a safe and, uh, and fun way. So we're well on to the, the fun part of our season here in town. Um, please, in the middle of, of all of the things that weigh us down and tax our spirit, please do have some fun. Please enjoy days. Please have experiences you want to remember because they are exciting, they are family oriented, they are community oriented, and uh, let's fight against the darkness but celebrate the light. Uh, Councillor Chavez, you had something? I wrote notes because I knew I was emotional and I still forgot to do this positive shout out. Um, and so I want to emphasize the positive. I've had the pleasure of working um, beside Noel Correa in um, parking. Um, and so he has been so patient with me and so kind and has educated me in so many ways. He's very brilliant. And so I just wanted to highlight him as a staff member and my appreciation for his work with me. Um, anytime I work with city staff, though, I think I'm always just kind of taken back by kind of the brilliance that we have here. So um, thank you all for always being there to teach me. Um, and I wanted to also wish my mother a birthday, her happy birthday. She. I'm going to say she turns 40 um, <laughs> tomorrow. She looks 40. I tell her, I pray every day I have your skin. Um, <laughs> I have my fingers crossed. Um, she is my inspiration. She is, I would have been nothing without this woman. So um, she's that example I have to do good, to be good, to give all I can. Um, and she pushes me every day to remind myself it's never enough. Um, we could always do more, especially for others. So, um, Mom, Tomasita Chavez, happy birthday. Thank you for all you are. Um, thank you for all you do. And um, thank you for always being my hero. So, thank you, Mayor, for that extra. Very good. Thank you. Uh, that completes the communications from the governing body. Um, if the assistant city clerk could take us to 15A, please. Yes, Mayor. Um, 15A is consideration of a bill. Um, it's sponsored by Mayor Weber, Councilwoman Villarreal, and Councilor Lindell. It's an ordinance amending Section 23-6.3 to align the designated drinking area buffer requirements with state requirements to require the use of recyclable or compo compostable alcohol beverage containers for events on city property and to permit tasting of mixed beverages containing liquor on city property. Uh, Mayor, do you want to do a brief overview of that? I think uh, Councilwoman Villarreal has the floor. I think the mayor doesn't want to start <laughs> with this. There's three of us that are supporting this. Yes, three. Um, Councilor Lindell, my, the mayor, and myself. And there's a few things that this does, I think the, the one piece that I wanted to focus on for this proposed bill, um, other than allowing for mixed beverages um, to be included in the, in, the mix, in the mix of alcoholic beverages at um, events on city property, is the um, buffer piece. The, the buffers never re was really consistent with what we required for events around a designated drinking area. So 
Um, instead of the confusing language we currently have, we're going to have it be at least six feet high, which is consistent with the state alcohol and beverage control division requirements. Um, in addition, I, I added this kind of a somewhat in the last minute, but I also thought about these events and how much waste occurs um, when you're doing samples of things, um, whether it's wine or other. And so we added to the bill that the alcoholic, alcoholic beverage containers would be made of recyclable and compostable material, which some people comply now, but I think that we can do better. This doesn't apply to food. We'll have to go into a completely different section of the code to change that in terms of um, requirements for containers of food. Um, so I'm looking into that. Um, is there anything else the sponsors, co-sponsors wanted to share? That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your carrying the ball. Uh, 15B, please. 15B is consideration of a resolution. This is sponsored by Councillor Michael Garcia and Councillor Lee Garcia. It's a resolution specifying that the down payment assistance program included in the FY23 budget be available to all full-time city employees. Um, Councillor Lee Garcia, would you like to make a brief overview on this? Yes, thank you, um, Assistant City Clerk. Um, so speaking on behalf of myself and um, Councillor Michael Garcia, who wasn't able to be here tonight, uh, a couple of things come to mind. And here our intent is um, to broaden the program to include all full-time city employees. Um, this is, this is in order is to create a program that is equitable to all. So in thinking of that, um, the first word that comes to mind is parity and um, creating an environment inclusive. Um, this being a pilot program, uh, given the opportunity for all who live in this city or who work in this, for this government, being able to um, have access to, to this program. And so that's, that's the main reason for this. And um, we'll be um, working on this throughout. And uh, thank you guys all for your time. Thank you. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Mayor Work. I'd like to move that this bill be referred to finance as well, please. Second. There's a motion to add finance to the process of considering this bill. Do you want to, Councillor Mayor Worth, I, I see you have our, I think you have our rules and processes in front of you. Could you, just for the benefit of, I, I haven't memorized them to the level I probably should have. What, what is the process you're citing here? Uh, so if you go to our new governing body procedural rules, uh, it is under uh, the legislative process, which is Roman numeral number four. It is uh, A4 is what I'm looking at. At the time of introduction, the sponsors in coordination with the legislative staff shall refer legislation to the appropriate standing committees and or City Council standing committees based on subject matter of the legislation. A member of the governing body may challenge the schedule proposed at introduction. Such challenge of the proposed schedule and proposed alternative referrals are subject to vote by the entire governing body at the time of introduction. This bill was referred only to quality of life. It is a financial matter and I believe it's appropriate for the Finance Committee to take a look and that's why I've made this motion. Is there a discussion in the motion? Mr. Yes, Councilor Garcia. I may just um, add in there. So being that there's no fiscal impact other than the fact that we are including a broader scope, um, you know, my question is why would it have to go to finance? Um, there's no fiscal impact that's being changed. It's just adding additional people to this. So I don't know why it has to go to finance. Councilor Romero, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I guess I, um, so while we have budgeted for this program, I would, I guess, disagree that it, it doesn't have a financial impact because you are taking the same amount of money and spreading it over a larger population. So that does have a fiscal impact in terms of how far that money will go. 
I think it also um, it is the purview of the Finance Committee to uh, recommend and to look at how money is earmarked. Uh, and um, this arguably adds another line item uh, for this program. So I, I think it absolutely has a financial, uh, there are financial implications. And I don't know why it wouldn't come to finance. Um, I think, you know, we used to send bills that actually had no subject matter re relevance to uh, more committees than they needed to be so that we could include more of the council at the committee level where we try to do our work. Uh, I don't know why we would argue for less process in something uh, as important as this program is, and um, I think it absolutely uh, should come to finance. Councilor Garcia? Um, and on that case, I would maybe just refer to the um, city attorney, and whereas when we um, requested the resolution um, under speaking with uh, Mr. Guillen and um, it was discussion about which communities it should hit. Um, finance was offered, but not necessarily required. Uh, is that correct? Mayor Weber, Councilor Garcia, I'm not sure with the content of your conversation with um, Mr. Guillen. Um, I do think it might be helpful. I can read the um, scope of the authority of the Finance Committee that's in our ordinance. Um, it's in Section 2-1.13. Um, and it says the finance committee shall provide continuing oversight of the operation of the city's finances and shall solicit public comment and study and make recommendations to the governing body concerning the city's annual operating and capital budgets, issuance of debt instruments, and financial operating policies, rules, and regulations. The committee may report to the governing body the cost of implementation of any order, ordinance, program, or other initiative pending before the body. The committee shall have the opportunity to review all matters concerning appropriations, city budgets, loans, previously unbudgeted expenditures, and financial issues related to all city-owned or leased facilities. Um, so I think, I don't know that it, anything, like you said, has to go to this committee. Um, I think it probably falls within the, the potential scope of responsibility, but it, it is up to a vote on that issue. Okay, so um, again, I, I I don't want to exclude anybody from having conversation about this because I think it's a very important um, part of our process here. Um, and, um, you know, again, I just need a clarification as to why it will have to go to finance. And, um, uh, you know, again, I don't want to be exclusive of anybody because I think having conversation over this and it's very important that we all talk about it um, and um, and go, go from there. So uh, thank you. Councilor Lindell, you uh, have the floor. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, Councilor Garcia, and I know you don't want to exclude anybody. And if it doesn't go to finance, it excludes me because it's the only committee that I sit on. So I would really like for it to come to finance. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilwoman Villarreal. Thank you, Mayor. In the way it's written now, I don't see that it has a financial impact. Um, However, I think it would be okay to go to finance because I'd actually like to increase the amount. We were talking about 750000 not being enough as it is, and I actually would like us to consider the potential of increasing that amount so that more employees will be able to have a larger pool of funding to be able to draw from for down payment assistance. So for that reason, I'd like it to go to finance because I'd like to see of the potential to look at um, other funding sources, well, our budget, but funding sources that we may potentially have, in, um, as we talked about in the budget hearing. So that would be why I think it would make sense to go to finance. Thank you. Councilor Chavez, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, I agree that it needs to go to finance. Um, Councilor Merrillworth, I do believe that it would create additional line items. I think that it also will alter the way that the funding will work or how much impact it would have. So I think it dives a lot into finance. Um, so I would like to see it in that committee as well. Thank you. Yes, City Attorney. Mayor Weber, Councilors, I would just like 
for folks to be fully aware when making their votes. Um, there won't be a budget adjustment associated with this, so that would, if, if that were the intent, I think we would need a different caption requesting a budget adjustment. This caption doesn't capture an increase because it does speak to the funding that's already in the budget and, and its availability, it's you know, a pool of eligibility. So I think you'd need to pursue a different action in order to actually increase the budget or change the budget. So the, this, the way that it's introduced here is to allocate the existing budget in a different way um, or in a very sp in a specific way really because it's not, the existing budget isn't required by law to be used a particular way. This would require it to be used that way. Thank you. Did you want to speak to some more? Just a question back about that. So even if the caption is written the way it is now, we can still amend the caption to potentially look at budget increase for this program. Mayor Weber, Councilor Villarreal, I think that would be a different piece of legislation. It, it would have a fiscal impact. This one does not. Um, this one says using the, the existing budget, the FY23 budget. Um, to change that budget, you would need to offset it with something else. So the budget would be like increasing this and decreasing that or decreasing the city's reserve in order to increase the amount available. For you. So there, there, it, there would be other impacts to the resolution that are not expressed here at all. I understand that, but I guess if we were to look at other potential adjustments, we could amend this to include that, couldn't we? I mean, we talked about that budget as being a we would need a resolution to be able to talk about any budget adjustments as it relates to this program, as well as it opening it up to all staff. Mayor Weber, Councilor Vieira, to do something different than what is in this caption, we would need a different resolution. If it were something like all full-time and part-time, even all full-time and part-time city employees is probably something we would, I mean, you'd want to announce differently. Um, and that's the, the most minor tweak I can think of um, to this. Okay. Mayor. Councilor. So, City Attorney McSherry, I, wouldn't you, you would need a budget adjustment request to add more money because you'd have to say where that money was coming from in the current budget. Uh, to your point, whether it was coming from reserves or whether you're cutting another line item to add more money to this one, not a resolution, but actually a budget adjustment request, or maybe you need both, I don't know. Mayor Weber, Councilor Merrillworth, because budget adjustment requests are submitted by staff, the only way to get one, I think, would be, I, and this is not something I think we contemplate specifically in our laws, is it would be calling on the city manager to submit a budget request. Okay, so there would have to be a resolution to say, <clears throat> we, we, the governing body, want the city manager to move money from reserves and add it to this program by this amount. I remember Councilor Merrowworth, I, I think that's probably okay. the most direct way it could happen. Okay, and then that budget adjustment request would have to come forward to actually move the money so I'm just, I, just, I, I just think it's important that we're clear about the steps because there has been a number of um, misunderstandings and confusion about how we're doing, how we go about doing this. So just want to be clear about the process. Mayor Weber, Councilor Romero-Worth, yes, I agree with your description. Okay. Uh, Councilor Garcia, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so back again. Um, the proposed resolution speaks only to um, including a, a broader scope of, of people. And so um, here again, we're not, you know, looking at uh, a monetary increase to the budget. We're just looking at being inclusive to more. And so um, if it goes to finance, that's okay. Um, uh, but I think the way it's presented right there, um, in, in our packet uh, and how we've, it's been presented by us is um, the way we'd like to see it proceed. And so um, uh, 
if there is can be further discussion at finance or quality of life or whoever in here at governing body well then so be it but um, um, this is where we're at and this is what we're, we're looking at so uh, we don't want to get it you know make it too messy we just want to include a broader scope and that's the that's the intent of this tonight thank you yes councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think, yes, that is that is clear that at the moment there is not a proposal for a change in the budget amount, but it is a discussion of how we spend our city money, uh, how we spend our money. Um, and that really does come under the purview of the Finance Committee. So I do think that it is important that we uh, bring it forward over to the Finance Committee, um, as well as I am glad to hear that it is going to quality of life because I do believe that that is also the other uh, really relevant committee. So um, that is why I seconded and support it going to Finance Committee for further discussion. Thank you. I would just say you know, there are two factors. First is relevance, and I think it passes that test. But before we adopted new rules, uh, and I think this is the first time this rule has been ex executed in my, in my experience, we essentially adopted a courtesy rule which said uh, if there's a committee that would like to have their voice heard on a matter, we tried to extend that courtesy just because it's more transparency, it's more opportunity for input, it's more opportunity for discussion. Uh, I, I remember there are times we simply added a third committee into the step of, of considering a measure simply to let more voices be heard, and it didn't really rest on the case of relevance. It was more, we want to let everybody have their opportunity to be a participant in shaping and debating uh, the legislation, and nobody should feel left out uh, under any circumstances. So I think it passes both tests, but I'm, I'm happy to have it go to finance and have more voices and more input. So that's, I think we've all had our say. Uh, let's take a vote. All right. Councillor Lee Garcia. Yes. Councillor Lindell. Yes. Councillor Romero Worth. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Councillor Cassett. Yes. Councillor Travis. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Motion passed. And Councillor Garcia, thank you for your both your explanation but also your understanding. I'm, I really appreciate it. Could you take us to item C then, please? Yes, Mayor. 15C is consideration of a resolution. This is sponsored by Councilor Rivera, Councilor Romero Worth, and Councilwoman Villarreal. It's a resolution proclaiming severe or extreme drought conditions exist in the city of Santa Fe, imposing fire restrictions from June 11th 2022 to July 10th, 2022, banning the sale or use of fireworks within the city of Santa Fe and prohibiting other fire hazard activities. Usually, uh, Councilor Rivera takes the microphone at this time, but uh, do either Councilor Merriworth or Councilwoman Rural, do you want to speak on this? Go right ahead. She's going to add something. Uh, okay, um, I, uh, this is uh, under state law. We have to do this every month, and uh, we have been since, I want to say, maybe February. Uh, shout out to Councillor Rivera for um, his leadership in, in recognizing we were going to need to do this and for getting um, it put in place early. Uh, I think we were ahead of the curve in terms of making sure that we're keeping the community as safe as possible by... Uh, prohibiting uh, or imposing these these restrictions and um, they're more important than ever and um, I'm just uh, proud to uh, co-sponsor and follow his leadership. Councilwoman. Thank you Mayor. Um, just to add to this piece, um, well for one I support this and although the 4th of July which is my birthday. I would love to be able to see <laughs> shoot off fireworks for my own birthday, but I think this is extremely important given our circumstances and the drought conditions we're in. I did speak with the fire um, department because I think there's a, a missing piece to this um, proclamation or resolution proclaiming the restrictions. I think there's a kind of a 
promotion of fire readiness that should be added to the mix and I wanted to just put this out there and, and figure out if it makes sense um, given this is really a specific resolution with language we use every month but I did want to um, think about how we could add language in that promotes fire readiness in the wildland urban interface area and actually giving recommendations about how people can reduce um, the risk of fire as it relates to like reducing flammable, flammable materials within five feet surrounding their primary residence, increasing defensible spaces within 30 feet surrounding their residence, also looking at re removing flammable litter and needle casts and also potentially um, adding that these recommendations come from the fire department with their wildfire hazardous assessment. So I want to consider adding that as it goes through committee to see if that's appropriate or germane to this. And according to the fire folks that I talked to today and the fire chief, they thought it made sense, but we wanted to run it past legal. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, that bill is now introduced. Can we move to the next one, please? Yes, Mayor, the next is 15D. It's consideration of a bill sponsored by Mayor Weber. It's an ordinance amending section 23-5.2 SFCC 1987 to specify that major commercial events are not entitled to use city property that is otherwise leased by the city. Thank you. Um, let me just say a few words about this. I think this uh, comes about as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic where we increased outdoor seating at restaurants because we wanted to uh, enhance the survivable economic rate of our small restaurants. We wanted to encourage social distancing and safe outdoor dining. Uh, at that time, we adopted resolutions that permitted the use of city sidewalk or right-of-way or other special properties for use as outdoor dining areas. Uh, that in that uh, adaptive behavior became a popular feature. And so now we want to uh, take that, uh, the popularity of the outdoor dining areas and the benefits they've had for our restaurants and the fun they've provided for our uh, outdoor diners and enter into leases with several of the outdoor dining uh, areas, small areas uh, uh, of some, are designated for use of a hand uh, for com major commercial events, and that's provided for. And the bill exempts uh, space leased or otherwise committed by the city from being used by major commercial events. So, we're simply trying to take a uh, what was an emergency, a piece of adaptive behavior, and make it a feature for Santa Fe outdoor dining. And uh, it'll work its way through the the uh, committee process and hopefully come back with a positive uh, recommendation to the governing body. Thank you for uh, taking us through the introductions. Um, 17A, if you please. 17A is consideration of a bill sponsored by Councilor Romero Worth and Councilor Cassett. It's an ordinance relating to the City of Santa Fe Uniform Traffic Ordinance amending Section 7 of Schedule A to prohibit the Municipal Court from notifying the Motor Vehicle Division of the State of New Mexico when a person fails to pay a penalty assessment within the required period of time. Um, here to present is Kyle Hibner, the City Prosecutor. And this is an opportunity for public comment after we've had a chance to have an overview of what the legislation proposes. So if you'd like to uh, give us your uh, presentation, it looks like you're hooking up your machine and getting ready to give us the benefit of a little overview, perhaps. No, it's a blank screen, but don't take it personally. <laughs> Very good, sir. Uh, good
Good evening, Mayor Weber and uh, members of the governing body. Um, so this, this bill would actually prohibit the municipal court from uh, sending notification to the New Mexico Motor Vehicle Department in the event that uh, a person fails to pay a penalty assessment, um, uh, penalty assessment fine. Um, currently in the, the city ordinances, there's a requirement that the municipal court does send notice to MBD. Um, when MBD gets that notification from uh, the municipal court, they are permitted to suspend a person's license um, pursuant to, to state statute. Um, so kind of just diving into what this, this bill changes, this is uh, Schedule A, um, Section 7C, as it currently reads, and this is in the Uniform Traffic Ordinance. Um, essentially requiring that the, uh, the municipal court send this notice if someone agrees to pay a penalty assessment and then doesn't pay it. Uh, the proposed language would, um, would add uh, not after shell, and then it would also strike the, uh, the last, um, last sentence. Um, as far as, uh, as, far as uh, the fiscal impact, not really any anticipated that it would be much of a fiscal impact. Um, it, it, it just prohibits the, the court from sending um, sending the notice to MBD that, that someone has not paid. It, it, it doesn't uh, touch with the municipal court's ability to try to enforce that, um, that, that agreement to pay either through uh, a failure to comply hearing, uh, bringing the person back in to explain why they haven't paid it, Offering, for example, community service instead of uh, instead of the fine payment plan, uh, things things like that, um, and uh, like I said, brief presentation and thank you. That's it. This is not up for uh, action. It's just uh, public comment and introduction. Uh, is there anybody who wishes to speak on this matter? If you'd come forward and give us your name, we'll give you two minutes. Good evening, Mayor Weber, members of the council, and staff. My name is Monica Alt. I'm a born and raised New Mexican and proud Santa Fe resident. I'm also a, an attorney and the state director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center. Uh, we stand in strong support of the proposed legislation. We'd also like to thank the wonderful counselors that are uh, that brought this forward. Um, license suspensions should be used to get dangerous drivers off the road. However, it's primarily used to punish people for missed court appointments and their inability to pay penalty assessment misdemeanors, both at the state level and, and here in our city. Um, because so few New Mexicans have access to reliable public transportation, debt-based driver's license suspensions force people to make an impossible choice. Stop driving and lose access to work uh, child care, health care, food, uh, uh, and other basic necessities, or keep driving on a suspended license and face additional criminal charges, more unaffordable fines and fees, and a variety of other collateral consequences. Ending this practice, however, will restore our community in a variety of ways. Uh, due to time, I won't go into all of them, but I'll focus on two. Um, first, this practice will improve Santa Fe's businesses and workforce. Uh, people need to drive to work and employers need employees that can drive. When people lose their license, over 40% also lose their jobs. And those who are able to find jobs take significant pay cuts. A wonderful study done by Arizona State University found that restoring just 7,000 licenses would increase the GDP by $149.6 million. Second, this practice, so ending this practice, um, would protect Santa Fe drivers from uninsured motorists. 
Suspended licenses increase insurance premiums and prevents many drivers from getting insurance at all. Getting rid of this practice will help ensure all drivers can get and keep insurance, bringing costs down and making the road safer for everybody. The bottom line is that when someone is unable to pay fines and fees, it doesn't help to suspend their driver's license. This actually just makes it harder for them to earn a living, take care of their families, pay off their court debts, and also comply with court orders. I appreciate the time that I was able to have today to speak with you all. I'll be following this bill through the process, and I'm happy to be a resource to anybody that might have any questions. Uh, we urge the council to approve this bill as it moves through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to speak to this bill? It's a public hearing. We'll give you also two minutes to speak to us, and please identify yourself. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council folks, and staff. Um, my name is Amber Farrell. I'm Deputy Director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center here in New Mexico, and I've been asked to read a statement on behalf of the New Mexico Advisory Board on Fines and Fees. The New, Mexico, the New Mexico Advisory Board on Fines and Fees stands in strong support of Item 17 on the governing body's agenda relating to driver's license suspension reform. The Advisory Board is a group of behavioral health and criminal justice reform professionals that have been directly impacted by the criminal legal system. Several of our board members live in, work in, or are from Santa Fe. Uh, the Advisory Board is all too familiar with the failures of, debt -based license, of the debt-based license suspension system. One of our founding members is from Santa Fe, and years ago, her license was suspended and a warrant for her arrest was issued for a speeding ticket she could not afford to pay. As a result, her fees piled up to hundreds of dollars, and when confronted by a judge, she agreed to payments she knew she could not afford for fear of being jailed. As a single mother of three children under the age of five and only caretaker to her father, jail was not an option, and neither was spending hours finding and completing community service, especially without the ability to drive. She spent months foregoing basic necessities for herself and her family, using primarily public assistance dollars to pay off her court fees and reinstatement fees and finally get her license back. One speeding ticket combined with a regressive driver's license suspension system financially devastated this family and her story is not uncommon in Santa Fe. Polling by Change Research in 2021 indicates the majority of New Mexicans oppose suspending driver's license, uh, licenses of people who cannot afford to immediately pay tickets or other fees and this holds across race, region, and political party. We urge the council to approve the proposed ordinance and allow it to move forward and act as a model for cities around our state. Thank you, and full, a full statement and further research is provided as written comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else at this time wants to speak to this bill from the public? Very good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Madam Assistant City Clerk. And Madam Clerk in the back, nice to see you. I hope everything is good with you. Well, we're glad you're here. But you're doing such a great job. Why bring somebody in from the bullpen? Why don't you continue with item 18A? That works for me, Mayor. Um, item 18 is final action on legislation. This is also a public hearing. Um, 18A is consideration of Bill 2022-9, Adoption of an ordinance. This is sponsored by Councilor Romero Worth, Councilor Cassett, Councilor Travis, and Councilwoman Villarreal. It's an ordinance amending Section 20-4.1 to remove reference to remote participation in governing body or city council standing committee meetings and creating a new section 1-9 SFCC 1987 to allow governing body members to attend governing body and City Council Standing Committee meetings remotely. Thank you. We'll get to public uh, comment in a minute, but uh, City Attorney, did you want to say a few words about this before we open it up for as a public hearing? I remember I'm happy to. Um, we didn't have a local rule about remote participation until the summer of 2019, um, and we adopted that before even knowing that the pandemic was going to hit. Um, it was lucky we had that in place. Um, we did put it in our emergency declaration ordinance, um, and it was being thought of in the scope of should the governing body not have enough people to have a quorum, we wanted to allow members of the governing body to appear remotely. 
Um, and so that um, was adopted back in 2019. And then early in the pandemic, we added that for committee members as well, um, in addition to governing body meetings. Um, so now what this would do is to take that ability out of our emergency declaration ordinance and put it in its own section to apply more generally. Um, and this is essentially allowing for remote participation in the circumstances that the Open Meetings Act allows for remote participation, which is when it's difficult or impossible and the technology allows each of the members to hear each other and the public to understand who's speaking at all times. Uh, any of the sponsors want to address this matter at this time? Councilwoman Virel. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to add that if we had this in place, um, Councilor Garcia, Michael Garcia would be with us virtually. And so that's why I think this would be helpful in case there's um, health issues or health um, emergencies and people want to still participate, but um, they're wanting to be careful um, specifically because of COVID. Um, I think it makes sense. So that's what I'll uh, say. City, city Attorney has a finger up. Uh, and Mayor Weber, Councilors, currently we do have a declared emergency. Um, so we're allowed to have the remote participation under our ordinance. Um, I think right now we don't have the technology to support it with hybrid, right. um, but we're hoping to get there because um, we will need that in addition to, um, so right, we are going to try to do hybrid in June, um, the current declarations in place till the 6th. So if this were not to pass and after the 6th, then we wouldn't be able to do it um, until the 6th. We still can under the emergency declaration. If we had the technology. If we, if we, if the technology works, which we are trying to get towards for at least, I think, um, certain participation. So right. we'll have to figure it's it out. It's both and. Uh, any other comments from the council, governing body, sponsors? Is there anyone in the uh, public who wishes to address this uh, bill? We have an opportunity now to speak because it is a public hearing. If not, I would entertain a motion. Up, oh, Councilor Garcia. I'm sorry. One last question. Thank you, Mayor. So, when will the technology be available? I mean, just a question. Uh, maybe Mr. Mr. Blair, do you have a technology answer? No, um, I don't understand technology, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilor Garcia. What we're working on right now is it's a staffing question in addition to technology. It takes more people to run Zoom plus YouTube plus the captions plus, etc. And so what we're working towards was it's a step-by-step -step process. You know, when COVID started, everything shut down, and we're sort of working in a stair-step process now where we began in-person meetings in the month of May, for the th and then in June, what we've identified are the three meetings that we believe have the largest amount of, of public participation, governing body meetings, the historical review board, and the planning commission meetings. We will begin in the month of June to identify that those meetings can take place in person with the members and the staff in person, and that the public primarily will be able to participate both in person and virtually through Zoom, um, so that they have the, that ability to get the maximum amount of public comment possible. My belief is that when that happens as well, we will be able to have that uh, in place as well for counselors or other people who, counselors or staff who are ill, injured, unavailable to attend, would be able to do that as well. So we are working towards that now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blair, and I appreciate that that answer. Um, again, you know, step by step, <laughs> we'll get there. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? I would entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. I heard a motion to approve uh, by Councillor Romero-Worth, a second from Councillor Cassett. Uh, further discussion? Madam Assistant City Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes, sir. Councilor Lindell? Yes. Councilor Romero Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Councilor Chavez? Yes. Councilor Lee Garcia? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. How about the next item on the agenda then, please? That is 18B, it's consideration of bill number 2022-10, adoption of an ordinance. This is sponsored by Councilor Romero Worth, Councilor Cassett, and Councilor Chavez. It's an ordinance relating to the City of Santa Fe Uniform Traffic Ordinance. 
creating a new Section 5 of Schedule B of the Uniform Traffic Ordinance to create the Low Income Financial Equity Live Parking Program. And I don't know if Noel is here. It doesn't appear to be the case, but um, would, uh, would any of our uh, sponsors care to speak to this and give it an introduction before we open the floor to public testimony? Councilor Mayor Ward. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I wasn't really thinking I was doing this. So here, we'll lean on our memos. Uh, so this bill uh, creates what we're calling the Life Parking Program. It's the Low Income Financial Equity Parking Program. It would provide qualified low income residents who agree to pay a reduced amount within 30 days, a reduction in their parking citation penalties, and the bill uh, proposes to amend Schedule B of the Uniform Traffic, Traffic Ordinance to establish this program. Uh, I think this, um, so just to, for those listening who may not have heard uh, this bill in committee, it, qualified participants in the life parking program would be offered an opportunity to reduce outstanding and unpaid parking citations in the following ways. A qualified applicant who is participating in the life parking program for the first time would be eligible to receive a 50% reduction in total parking citation debt owed to the city. A qualified applicant is participating in the life program for the second time, would be eligible to receive a 25% reduction in total parking debt owed to the city. Uh, and a full payment of the reduction amount would be required within 30 days from the approval of the applicant's um, application. So uh, you can only participate twice within a rolling five-year period. And I, I think this is a way to, again, this, this falls in line with some of the other legislation we've been talking about in terms of fines and fees, uh, helping to work with people so that we don't spiral them into debt so that they have ways to uh, pay for mistakes uh, without um, carrying really long-term debt. And I think the city actually may get money that they wouldn't otherwise um, because people want to settle their fares. So I defer to any of the other sponsors if I Thank missed you. some elements. Thank you for the overview. Is there any comment, Councilor Casson? Councilor Chavez? I think Councillor Merriworth uh, very much covered it. Uh, good job relying on the memo. Um, and again, really in, in combination with the um, other bill that was up for public comment tonight is, is how we look at uh, balancing the need for you know enforcing our ordinances and our laws, but really we do not want them to be so punitive that it uh, really negatively and permanently can impact the quality of life for individuals. Um, so I really I do want to thank Noel for his work on this. I'm, I'm sorry he's not here for me to be able to give him that that recognition. And uh, thank you, Councilor Romero Worth, for uh, working on this, and, and Councilor Chavez for signing on as well. Thank you. And I think you two did a wonderful job in explaining it. I think one of the things that from constituents' concerns that um, I've received have been um, like been talking about well, then the city's not going to get fees paid. And I don't think they understand that this is actually going to increase fees being paid because it becomes a more, pa a more manageable plan for them to do so. Um, so I think really understanding that when those amounts grow and they get into this like cycle where they feel caught and unable to pay, it just becomes an impossible thing for them to address. This is really helping with that. So I think it would allow um, individuals a plan to pay for this and actually get out of that and so money's actually coming to the city for some of those fees and fines so it's actually a positive when it comes to that so i wanted to address address that because i know some emails came to me with that concern but in fact it would have positive impact thank you thank you all uh, if there's anyone in the public who wants to speak to this measure now would be the time to step up to the podium please it's a public hearing I don't see anyone approaching the podium I would entertain a motion on this bill move to approve second 
There's a motion to approve, and there is a second. Is there any further discussion? Councilwoman Villarreal. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as I said in committee, I support this program. <coughs> it, it wasn't clear from staff how they would really be able to track it. So I'm hoping that they'll really work hard to try to make sure that we're um, attracting the right people that act, obviously have debt and that need to know about this program. It was unclear about how we would be able to make sure those folks, especially those in most need with, in the, that are in major debt, would know about this. Um, so I'm hoping that they can kind of be clear about their process. I wish um, Director Correa was here. There was some information I asked him to um, provide for me, um, and I guess he'll have to get it to me after the fact. Um, but I think it was just the record keeping piece and making sure that the right people are targeted, as well as um, I didn't make this an amendment, but I really would like to check in a year just to see, like, how's it going? How many people have utilized this? How did they find out about it? And just make sure that we're tracking that um, clearly because I think there will be people that will benefit from this um, as long as they know it's there. <laughs> so um, that was unclear when we talked about that in committee. So I think we'll just um, see how it goes. And I, I want to I wanna be, I'm going to be supporting this, obviously. Um, but I think there's just some nuances that we have to make sure we're making we're tracking, so that's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Could you please call the roll? Council Romero Worth. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Council Cassett. Yes. Council Chavez. Yes. Council Lee Garcia. Yes. Council Lindell. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. I uh, believe that our next item is an appointment. You 20A is appointment of the City of Santa Fe's Emergency Management Director, Brian Williams, to the City's Local Coordinator of Emergency Management. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Ochoa, do you have uh, some comments to make? Yes. Please, please enlighten us. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, um, members of the council, thank you so much for letting us take this time at the end of this meeting to do this. Um, as the memo um, outlines, state statute dictates that the governing body appoint our um, local coordinator of emergency management, and that is what we're doing here tonight. Um, but I wanted to take the opportunity to just say a short something here, because I don't believe that the city of Santa Fe has ever needed an emergency manager to the, deg to the degree that we've needed an emergency manager um, in the last three years. And in Brian Williams, who's held the um, positions uh, since July of 21, before that he was interim, we, have, we are incredibly fortunate to have a very experienced um, expert in his field whose professional relationships throughout the state um, are often sought out by our neighboring communities for advice and expertise. Um, usually emergencies end. When I took this position, I asked, what is the definition of an emergency? And it was time bound. Really, if you think about uh, the pandemic, the critical incident with loss of life involving our police department, now the fires. Brian really has been leading us through one long emergency ever since he took this position. Um, he is always planning for the worst with good humor and um, incredible knowledge of, of all of the scenarios that we all need to consider, including active shooter training, which he's currently planning for us, um, and much, much more. Um, He's even finding us funding for the 2018 flood right now. Do you remember that? <laughs> so it never ends for Brian. Um, he's responsive. He's cooperative. He's open to all good ideas. And he will answer his phone to state and local partners at all hours of the day or night, no matter how much I tell him. Maybe he should take a rest. So I really hope you will join me in expressing um, our appreciation to Brian for his incredibly dedicated service 
to keeping our community safe in these unprecedented times. And I really hope he can put his feet up soon for all of our sakes, too. Thank you, Director Ochoa. Um, I, let me entertain a motion, and then I think we have to grill uh, Mr. Williams to uh, really d ascertain whether he's qualified to hold this post because uh, this is no, I'm just kidding. Is there move to approve? We're going to get some. We're going to have some fun. But first, let's get a motion. Move to approve. There's a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. All right. Are there questions for Mr. Williams? Mr. Williams, would you like to address the governing body? Well, I just and and will underscore what I said the last time I stood here. How much I appreciate the support of my director, the city manager, all of you counselors who I've interacted with in one way or another over the last couple of years. I believe Santa Fe um, has room to grow, and I believe that this leadership um, sees it and is supporting it. And I look forward to seeing what we can do to make Santa Fe a, a safer and more resilient community. Any questions? I, I just I can testify to Mr. Williams' work ethic. I have never been to an event bright early in the morning before people arrive. He's been there for hours setting up shop, making sure that whether it's vaccinations that are going on or the setup over at the GCCC is in order, should we get uh, people coming down to stay at, uh, as our guests, uh, going over to any situation that qualifies as an emergency or could qualify as an emergency, he's already planned for it and he's there and making a big difference. Uh, Councilor Lindell, did you have a question? Comment. Yes, please. Um, I can well attest that um, when you call Mr. Williams, he answers the phone. When you text him, he texts back immediately. I've had lots and lots of communication with him, and um, I'm grateful for the way that you do that. I, you know, um, anytime I call, it's I have a reason, and you always answer the phone. And um, I'm very, very grateful to you that the way that the way that you've helped me with numerous situations. And if we didn't know how important you were before, we do now for sure. Anybody else? Because it's fair game. You can ask him whether you know he's prepared for an untold emergency. <laughs> I say, Councilor, no, don't name them because they might arrive. Fair enough. All right. Uh, if there's no other uh, discussion of this nomination, could the clerk call the roll, please? Yes, Mayor. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Councilor Cassett. Yes. Councilor Chavez. Yes. Councilor Lee Garcia. Yes. Councilor Lindell. Yes. Councilor Romero Worth. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes, absolutely. Motion passed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, that completes our agenda for tonight. Uh, it is 8.36. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.